Chapter One of the Little White Bird. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry. Chapter One. David and I set forth upon a journey. Sometimes the little boy who calls me father brings me an invitation from his mother. I shall be so pleased if you will come and see me. And I always reply in some such words as these, Dear madam, I decline. And if David asks me why I decline, I explain that it is because I have no desire to meet the woman. Come this time, father, he urged lately, for it is her birthday, and she is twenty-six which is so great an age to David that I think he fears she cannot last much longer. Twenty-six, is she, David? I replied. Tell her I said she looks more. I had my delicious dream that night. I dreamt that I too was twenty-six, which was a long time ago, and that I took train to a place called my home, whose whereabouts I see not in my waking hours. And when I alighted at the station, a dear lost love was waiting for me, and we went away together. She met me in no ecstasy of emotion, nor was I surprised to find her there. It was as if we had been married for years and parted for a day. I like to think that I gave her some of the things to carry. Were I to tell my delightful dream to David's mother, to whom I have never in my life addressed one word, she would droop her head and raise it bravely to imply that I make her very sad, but very proud, and she would be wishful to lend me her absurd little pocket handkerchief. And then, had I the heart, I might make a disclosure that would startle her, for it is not the face of David's mother that I see in my dreams. Has it ever been your lot, reader, to be persecuted by a pretty woman who thinks, without a tittle of reason, that you are bowed down under a hopeless partiality for her? It is thus that I have been pursued for several years now by the unwelcome sympathy of the tender-hearted and virtuous Mary Ann. When we pass in the street, the poor deluded soul subdues her buoyancy, as if it were shame to walk happy before one she has lamed and at such times the rustle of her gown is whispered words of comfort to me, and her arms are kindly wings and that wish I were a little boy like David. I also detect in her a fearful elation, which I am unaware of until she has passed, when it comes back to me like a faint note of challenge. Eyes that say, you never must. Nose that says, why don't you? And a mouth that says, I rather wish you could. Such is the portrait of Mary Ann as she and I pass by. Once she dared to address me, so that she could boast to David that I had spoken to her. I was in the Kensington Gardens, and she asked, Would I tell her the time, please, just as children ask, and forget as they run back with her to their nurse. But I was prepared even for this, and raising my hat, I pointed with my staff to a clock in the distance. She should have been overwhelmed, but as I walked on, listening intently, I thought with displeasure that I heard her laughing. Her laugh is very like David's, whom I could punch all day in order to hear him laugh. I dare say she put this laugh into him. She has been putting qualities into David, altering him, turning him forever on a lathe since the day she first knew him, and indeed long before and also deftly that he is still called a child of nature. When you release David's hand, he is immediately lost like an arrow from the bow. No sooner do you cast eyes on him than you are thinking of birds. It is difficult to believe that he walks to the Kensington Gardens. He always seems to have alighted there, and were I to scatter crumbs, I opine he would come and peck. This is not what he set out to be. It is all the doing of that timid-looking lady who affects to be greatly surprised by it. He strikes a hundred gallant poses in a day. When he tumbles, which is often, he comes to the ground like a Greek god. So Marianne has willed it. But how she suffers that he may achieve. I have seen him climbing a tree, while she stood beneath in utterable anguish. She had to let him climb, for boys must be brave, 
but i am sure that as she watched him she fell from every branch david admires her prodigiously he thinks her so good that she will be able to get him into heaven however naughty he is otherwise he would trespass less light-heartedly perhaps she has discovered this for as i learned from her she warned him lately that she is not such a dear as he thinks her i am very sure of it i replied is she such a dear as you think her he asked me heaven help her i said if she be not dearer than that heaven help all mothers if they be not really dears for their boy will certainly know it in that strange short hour of the day when every mother stands revealed before her little son that dread hour ticks between six and seven when children go to bed later the revelation has ceased to come he is lapped in for the night now and lies quietly there madam with great mysterious eyes fixed upon his mother he is summing up your day nothing in the revelations that kept you together and yet apart in playtime can save you now you two are of no age no experience of life separates you it is the boy's hour and you have come up for judgment have i done well today my son you have got to say it and nothing may you hide from him he knows all how like your voice has grown to his but more tremulous and both so solemn so unlike the voice of either of you by day you were a little unjust to me today about the apple were you not mother stand there woman by the foot of the bed and cross your hands and answer him yes my son i was i thought but what you thought will not affect the verdict was it fair mother to say that i could stay out till six and then pretend it was six before it was quite six no it was very unfair i thought would it have been a lie if i had said it was quite six? Oh, my son my son i shall never tell you a lie again no mother please don't my boy have i done well today on the whole suppose he were unable to say yes these are the merest piccadillos you may say is it then a little thing to be false to the agreement you signed when you got the boy there are mothers who avoid their children in that hour but this will not save them why is it that so many women are afraid to be left alone with their thoughts between six and seven i am not asking this of you mary i believe that when you close david's door softly there is a gladness in your eyes and the awe of one who knows that the god to whom little boys say their prayers has a face very like their mother's i may mention here that david is a stout believer in prayer and has had his first fight with another young christian who challenged him to the jump and prayed for victory which david thought was taking an unfair advantage so mary is twenty-six i say david she is getting on tell her that i am coming to kiss her when she is fifty-two he told her and i understand that she pretended to be indignant when i pass her in the streets now she pouts clearly preparing for our meeting she has also said i learn that i shall not think so much of her when she is fifty-two meaning that she will not be so pretty then so little does the sex know of beauty surely a spirited old lady may be the prettiest sight in the world for my part i confess that it is they and not the young ones who have ever been my undoing just as i was about to fall in love i suddenly found that i preferred the mother indeed i cannot see a likely young creature without impatiently considering her chances for say fifty-two. Oh, you mysterious girls when you are fifty-two we shall find you out you must come into the open then if the mouth has fallen sourly yours the blame all the meannesses your youth concealed have been gathering in your face but the pretty thoughts and sweet ways and dear forgotten kindnesses linger there also to bloom in your twilight like evening primroses is it not strange that though i talk thus plainly to david about his mother he still seems to think me fond of her how oh, now i reflect what sort of bumpkin is this and perhaps i say to him cruelly boy you are uncommonly like your mother to which david is that why you are so kind to me i suppose i am kind to him but if so it is not for love of his mother but because he sometimes calls me father 
on my honor as a soldier there is nothing more in it than that i must not let him know this for it would make him conscious and so break the spell that binds him and me together oftenest i am but captain william to him and for the best of reasons he addresses me as father when he is in a hurry only and never have i dared ask him to use the name he says come father with an accursed beautiful carelessness so let it be david for a little while longer i like to hear him say it before others as in shops when in shops he asks the salesman how much money he makes in a day and which draw he keeps it in and why his hair is so red and does he like achilles of whom david has lately heard and is so enamored that he wants to die to meet him at such times the shopkeepers accept me as his father and i cannot explain the peculiar pleasure this gives me i am always in two minds then to linger that we may have more of it and to snatch him away before he volunteers the information he is not really my father when david meets achilles i know what will happen the little boy will take the hero by the hand call him father and drag him away to some round pond one day when david was about five i sent him the following letter dear david if you really want to know how it began will you come and have a chop with me today at the club mary who i have found out opens all his letters gave her consent and i doubt not instructed him to pay heed to what happened so that he might repeat it to her for despite her curiosity she knows not how it began herself i chuckled guessing that she expected something romantic he came to me arrayed as for a mighty journey and looking unusually solemn as little boys always do look when they are wearing a great coat there was a shawl round his neck you can take some of them off i said when we come to summer shall we come to summer he asked properly awed to many summers i replied for we are going away back david to see your mother as she was in the days before there was you we hailed a hansom drive back six years i said to the cabby and stop at the junior old fogies club he was a stupid fellow and i had to guide him with my umbrella the streets were not quite as they had been in the morning for instance the bookshop at the corner was now selling fish i dropped david a hint of what was going on it doesn't make me littler does it he asked anxiously and then with a terrible misgiving it won't make me too little will it father by which he meant that he hoped it would not do for him altogether he slipped his hand nervously into mine and i put it in my pocket you can't think how little david looked as we entered the portals of the club end of chapter one Chapter Two of the Little White Bird. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry. Chapter Two The Little Nursery Governess. As I enter the club smoking room, you are to conceive David vanishing into nothingness and that it is any day six years ago at two in the afternoon i ring for coffee cigarette and cherry brandy and take my chair by the window just as the absurd little nursery governess comes tripping into the street i always feel that i have rung for her while i'm lifting the coffee pot cautiously lest the lid fall into the cup she is crossing to the post office as i select the one suitable lump of sugar she is taking six last looks at the letter with the aid of william i light my cigarette and now she is re-reading the delicious address i lie back in my chair and by this time she has dropped the letter down the slit i toy with my liqueur and she is listening to hear whether the postal authorities have come for her letter i scowl at a fellow member who has had the impudence to enter the smoking room and her two little charges are pulling her away from the post office when I look out the window again, she is gone, but I shall ring for her tomorrow at two sharp. She must have passed the window many times before I noticed her. I know not where she lives, though I suppose it is to be hard by. 
She is taking the little boy and girl who bully her to the St. James Park, as their hoops tell me, and she ought to look crushed and faded. No doubt her mistress overworks her. It must enrage the other servants to see her deporting herself as if she were quite the lady. I noticed that she had sometimes other letters to post, but that the posting of the one only was a process. They shot down the slit, plebeians all, but it followed pompously like royalty. I have even seen her blow a kiss after it. Then there was her ring, of which she was as conscious as if it, rather than she, was what came gaily down the street. She felt it through her glove to make sure that it was still there. She took off the glove and raised the ring to her lips, though I doubt not it was the cheapest trinket. She viewed it from afar by stretching out her hand. She stooped to see how it looked near the ground. She considered its effect on the right of her and on the left of her, and through one eye at a time. Even when you saw that she had made up her mind to think hard of something else, the little silly would take another look. I give anyone three chances to guess why Mary was so happy. No, and no, and no. The reason was simply this, that a lout of a young man loved her, and so instead of crying because she was the merest nobody, she must forsooth sail jauntily down Paul Mall, very trim as to her tackle, and ticketed with the insufferable air of an engaged woman. At first her complacency disturbed me, but gradually it became part of my life at two o'clock with the coffee, the cigarette, and the liqueur. Now comes the tragedy. Thursday is her great day. She has from two to three every Thursday for her very own. Just think of it. This girl, who was probably paid several pounds a year, gets a whole hour to herself once a week. And what does she do with it? Attend classes for making her a more accomplished person? Not she. This is what she does. Sets sail for Paul Mall, wearing all her pretty things, including the blue feathers, and with such a sparkle of expectation on her face that I stir my coffee quite fiercely. On ordinary days she at least tries to look demure, but on a Thursday she has had the assurance to use the glass door of the club as a mirror in which to see how she likes her engaging trifle of a figure today. In the meantime, a long-legged oaf is waiting for her outside the post office, where they meet every Thursday. A fellow who always wears the same suit of clothes, but has a face that must ever make him free of the company of gentlemen. He is one of your lean, clean Englishmen who strip so well, and I fear me he is handsome. I say fear, for your handsome men have always annoyed me and had I lived in the dueling days, I swear I would have called every one of them out. He seems to be quite unaware that he is a pretty fellow, but, Lord, how obviously Mary knows it. I conclude that he belongs to the artistic classes. He is so easily elated and depressed, and because he carries his left thumb curiously, as if it were feeling for the whole of a palette. I've entered his name among the painters, I find pleasure in deciding that they are shocking bad pictures, for obviously no one buys them. I feel sure Mary says they are splendid. She's that sort of a woman. Hence the rapture with which he greets her. Her first effect upon him is to make him shout with laughter. He laughs suddenly, ha, from an eager, exulting face, then ha again, and then when you're thanking heaven that it's at last over, comes a final ha, louder than the others. I take them to be roars of joy, because Mary is his, and they have a ring of youth about them that is hard to bear. I could forgive him everything save his youth, but it is so aggressive that I have sometimes to order William testily to close the window. How much more deceitful than her lover is the little nursery governess. The moment she comes into sight, she looks at the post office and sees him. Then she looks straight before her, and now she is observed, and he rushes across to her in a glory, and she starts, positively starts, as if he had taken her by surprise. Observe her hand rising suddenly to her wicked little heart. This is the moment when I stir my coffee violently. He gazes down at her in such rapture that he is in everybody's way, and as she takes his arm she gives it a little squeeze, and then away they strut. Mary doing nine-tenths of the talking. 
I fall to wondering what they will look like when they grow up. What a ludicrous difference do these two nobodies make to each other? You can see that they are to be married when he has two pence. Thus I have not an atom of sympathy with this girl, to whom London is famous only as the residence of a young man who mistakes her for someone else. But her happiness had become part of my repast at 2 p.m., and when one day she walked down Pall Mall without gradually posting a letter, I was most indignant. It was as if William had disobeyed orders. Her two charges were as surprised as I, and pointed questioningly to the slit at which she shook her head. She put her finger to her eyes, exactly like a sad baby, and so passed from the street. Next day the same thing happened, and I was so furious that I bit through my cigarette. Thursday came when I prayed that there might be an end of this annoyance. But no, neither of them appeared on that acquainted ground. Had they changed their post office? No for her eyes were red every day, and heavy was her foolish little heart. Love had put out his lights, and the little nursery governess walked in darkness. I felt I could complain to the committee. Oh, you selfish young zany of a man, after all you have said to her, won't you make it up and let me return to my coffee? Not he. Little nursery governess, I appeal to you, annoying girl. Be joyous as of old during the five minutes of the day when you are anything to me. And for the rest of the time, so far as I am concerned, you may be as wretched as you list. Show some courage. I assure you he must be a very bad painter. Only the other day I saw him looking longingly into the window of a cheap Italian restaurant, and in the end he had to crush down his aspirations with two penny scones. You can do better than that. Come, Mary. All in vain. She wants to be loved, can't do without love from morning till night. Never knew how little a woman needs till she'd lost that little. They are all like this. Zounds, madam, if you're resolved to be a drooping little figure till you die, you might at least do it in another street. Not only does she maliciously depress me by walking past on ordinary days, but I have discovered that every Thursday from two to three she stands afar off, gazing hopelessly at the romantic post office, where she and he shall meet no more. In these windy days she is like a homeless leaf blown about by passerbys. There's nothing I can do except thunder at William. At last she accomplished her unworthy ambition. It was a wet Thursday and from the window where I was writing letters I saw the forlorn soul taking up her position at the top of the street. In a blast of fury I rose with one letter I had completed, meaning to write the others in my chambers. She had driven me from the club. I had turned out of Pall Mall into a side street, when whom should I strike against but her false swain? It was my fault, but I hit out at him savagely, as I always do when I run into anyone in the street and then I looked at him. He was hollow-eyed, he was muddy, there was not a haw left in him. I never saw a more abject young man. He had not even the spirit to resent the testy stab I had given him with my umbrella. But this is the important thing. He was glaring wistfully at the post-office, and thus in a twink I saw that he still adored my little governess. Whatever had been their quarrel, he was as anxious to make up as she and perhaps he had been here every Thursday, while she was round the corner in Pall Mall, each watching the post-office for an apparition. But from where they hovered, neither could see the other. I think what I did was quite clever. I dropped my letter unseen at his feet, and sauntered back to the club. Of course, a gentleman who finds a letter on the pavement feels bound to post it, and I presumed that he would naturally go to the nearest office. With my hat on, I strolled to the smoking-room window, and was just in time to see him posting my letter across the way, and then I looked for the little nursery governess. I saw her as woe-begone as ever, and then suddenly, oh, you poor little soul, and has it really been as bad as that? She was crying outright, and he was holding both her hands. It was a disgraceful exhibition. The young painter would evidently explode if he could not make use of his arms. She must die if she could not lay her head upon his breast. I must admit that he rose to the occasion. He hailed a hansom. William, 
said I gaily. Coffee, cigarette, and cherry brandy. As I sat there watching that old play, David plucked my sleeve to ask what I was looking at so deedily, and when I told him, he ran eagerly to the window. But when he reached it, just too late to see the lady who was to become his mother. What I told him of her doings, however, interested him greatly, and he intimated rather shyly that he was acquainted with a man who said, Haw, haw, haw. On the other hand, he irritated me by betraying an idiotic interest in the two children, whom he seemed to regard as the hero and heroine of the story. What were their names? How old were they? Had they both hoops? Were they iron hoops or just wooden hoops? Who gave them their hoops? You don't seem to understand, my boy, I said tartly, that had I not dropped that letter, there would never have been a little boy called David Andrews. But instead of being appalled by this, he asked, sparkling, whether I meant that he would still be a bird flying about in the Kensington Gardens. David knows that all children in our parts of London were once birds in the Kensington Gardens, and that the reason there are bars on nursery windows and a tall fender by the fire is because very little people sometimes forget that they have no longer wings and try to fly away through the window or up the chimney. Children in the bird stage are difficult to catch. David knows that many people have none, and his delight on a summer afternoon is to go with me to some spot in the gardens where these unfortunates may be seen, trying to catch one with small pieces of cake. That the birds know what would happen if they were caught, and if even a little undecided about which is the better life, is obvious to every student of them. And thus, if you leave your empty perambulator under the trees and watch from a distance, you will see the birds boarding it and hopping about from pillow to blanket in a twitter of excitement. They're trying to find out how babyhood would suit them. Quite the prettiest sight in the gardens is when the babies stray from the tree where the nurse is sitting and are seen feeding the birds, not a grown-up near them. It is first a bit to me and then a bit to you, and all the time such a jabbering and laughing from both sides of the railing. They're comparing notes and inquiring for old friends, and so on. But what they say I cannot determine, for when I approach, they all fly away. The first time I ever saw David was on the sward behind the baby's walk. He was a missile thrush, attracted thither that hot day by a hose which lay on the ground, sending forth a gay trickle of water, and David was on his back in the water, kicking up his legs. He used to enjoy being told of this, having forgotten all about it, and gradually it all came back to him with a number of other incidents that had escaped my memory, though I remember that he was eventually caught by the leg with a long string and a cunning arrangement of twigs near the round pond. He never tires of this story, but I notice that it is now he who tells me, rather than I, to him. And when we come to the string he rubs his little leg as if it still smarted. So when David saw his chance of being a missile thrush again, he called out to me quickly, Don't drop the letter! And there were treetops in his eyes. Think of your mother, I said severely. He said he would often fly in to see her. The first thing he would do would be to hug her. No, he would alight on the water jug first and have a drink. Tell her father, he said with horrid heartlessness always to have plenty of water in it, cause if I had to lean down too far, I might fall in and be drowned. Am I not to drop the letter, David? Think of your poor mother without her boy. It affected him, but he bore up. When she was asleep, he said, he would hop on to the frilly things of her nightgown and peck at her mouth. And then she would wake up, David, and find that she had only a bird instead of a boy. Well, this shock to Mary was more than he could endure. You can drop it, he said with a sigh. So I dropped the letter, as I think I have already mentioned. And that is how it all began. End of chapter 2for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry. Chapter 3 Her Marriage, Her Clothes, Her Appetite, 
and an inventory of her furniture. A week or two after I dropped the letter, I was in a hansom on my way to certain barracks, when loud above the city's roar I heard that accursed haw, 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 and there they were, the two of them, just coming out of a shop where you may obtain pianos on the hire system. I had the merest glimpse of them, but there was an extraordinary rapture on her face, and his head was thrown proudly back, and all because they had been ordering a piano on the hire system. So they were to be married directly. It was all rather contemptible, but I passed on tolerantly, for it is only when she is unhappy that this woman disturbs me, owing to a clever way she has at such times of looking more fragile than she really is. When next I saw them, they were gazing greedily out the window of the sixpenny halfpenny shop, which is one of the most deliciously dramatic spots in London. Mary was taking notes feverishly on a slip of paper while he did the adding up, and in the end they went away gloomily without buying anything. I was in high feather. Match abandoned, ma'am, I said to myself. Outlook hopeless. Another visit to the governess's agency inevitable. Can't marry for want of a kitchen shovel. But I was imperfectly acquainted with a lady. A few days afterwards I found myself walking behind her. There's something artful about her skirts, by which I always know her, though I can't say what it is. She was carrying an enormous parcel that might have been a bird cage wrapped in brown paper, and she took it into a bric-a-brac shop and came out without it. She then ran rather than walked in the direction of the sixpenny halfpenny shop. Now mystery of any kind is detestable to me, and I went into the bric-a-brac shop, ostensibly to look at the cracked china and there, still on the counter, with the wrappings torn off it, was the article Mary had sold in order to furnish on the proceeds. What do you think it was? It was a wonderful doll's house, with dolls at tea downstairs, and dolls going to bed upstairs, and a doll showing a doll out the front door. Loving lips had long ago licked most of the paint off, but otherwise the thing was in admirable preservation. Obviously, the joy of Mary's childhood. It had now been sold by her that she might get married. Lately purchased by us, said the shopwoman, seeing me look at the toy, from a lady who has no further use of it. I think I have seldom been more indignant with Mary. I bought the doll's house, and as they knew the lady's address, it was at this shop that I first learned her name. I instructed them to send it back to her with the following letter, which I wrote in the shop. Dear Madam, don't be ridiculous. You will certainly have further use for this. I am, etc., the man who dropped the letter. It pained me afterward, but too late to rescind the order, to reflect that I had sent her a wedding present, and when next I saw her, she had been married for some months. The time was nine o'clock of a November evening, and we were in a street of shops that has not in twenty years decided whether to be genteel or frankly vulgar. Here it minces in the fashion, but take a step onward, and its tongue is in the cup of the ice-cream man. I usually rush this street, which is not far from my rooms, with a glass down, but to-night I was walking. Mary was in front of me, leaning in a somewhat foolish way on the whore, and they were chatting excitedly. She seemed to be remonstrating with him for going forward, yet more than half admiring him for not turning back, and I wondered why. And after all, what was it that Mary and her painter had come out to do? To buy two pork chops. On my honor, she had been trying to persuade him, I decided, that they were living too lavishly. That was why she sought to draw him back. But in her heart she loves audacity, and that is why she admired him for pressing forward. No sooner had they bought the chops than they scurried away like two gleeful children to cook them. I followed, hoping to trace them to their home. But they soon outdistanced me, and that night I composed the following aphorism. It is idle to attempt to overtake a pretty young woman carrying pork chops. I was now determined to be done with her, first, however, to find out their abode, which was probably within easy distance of the shop. I even conceived them lured into taking their house by the advertisement, conveniently situated for the pork emporium. 
well one day now this really is romantic and i am rather proud of it my chambers are on the second floor and are backed by an anxiously polite street between which and mine are little yards called i think gardens they are so small that if you have the tree your neighbor has the shade from it i was looking out my back window on the day we've come to when whom did i see but the willem nursery governess sitting on a chair in one of these gardens i put up my eyeglass to make sure and undoubtedly it was she but as she sat there doing nothing which was by no means my conception of the jade so i brought a field glass to bear and discovered that the object was merely a lady's jacket it hung on the back of a kitchen chair seemed to be a furry thing and i must suppose was suspended there for an airing i was chagrined and then I insisted stoutly with myself that as it was not Mary, it must be Mary's jacket. I had never seen her wear such a jacket, mind you, and yet I was confident. I can't tell why. Do clothes absorb a little of the character of their wearer, so that I recognize this jacket by a certain coquetry? If she has a way with her skirts that always advertises me of her presence, quite possibly she is as cunning with jackets. Or perhaps she is her own seamstress and puts in little tucks of herself figure it what you please But I beg to inform you that I put on my hat and five minutes afterward Saw Mary and her husband emerge from the house to which I had calculated that garden belonged Now am I clever or am I not? When they had left the street I examined the house leisurely and a droll house it is Seen from the front it appears to consist of a door and a window though above them the trained eye may detect another window The air hole of some apartment which it would be just like Mary's grandiloquence to call her bedroom The houses on each side of this van box are tall and I discovered later that it had once been an open passage to the back gardens The story and the half of which it consists had been knocked up cheaply by carpenters I should say rather than masons and the general effect is of a brightly colored van that has stuck forever on its way through the passage The low houses of London look so much more homely than the tall ones that I never pass them without dropping a blessing on their builders But this house was ridiculous Indeed it did not call itself a house for over the door was a board with the inscription this space to be sold and I remembered as I rang the bell that this notice had been up for years on avowing that I wanted a space I was admitted by an elderly somewhat dejected looking female whose fine figure was not on scale with her surroundings Perhaps my face said so for her first remark was explanatory They get me cheap she said because I drink I bowed and we passed on to the drawing room I forget whether I have described Mary's personal appearance, but if so you have a picture of that sunny drawing room My first reflection was how can she have found the money to pay for it all? Which is always your first reflection when you see Mary herself a tripping down the street I Have no space in that little room to catalogue all the whim whams with which she had made it beautiful from the hand sewn bell rope which pulled no bell to the hand-painted cigar box that contained no cigars the floor was of a delicious green with exquisite oriental rugs green and white i think was the lady's scheme of color something cool you observe to keep the sun under the window curtains were of some rare material and the color of the purple clematis they swept the floor grandly and suggested a picture of mary receiving visitors the piano we may ignore for i knew it to be hired but there were many dainty pieces mostly in green wood a sofa a corner cupboard and the most captivating desk which was so like its owner that it could have sat down at her and dashed off a note the writing paper on this desk had the word mary printed on it implying that if there were other marys they didn't count there were many oil paintings on the walls mostly without frames and i must mention the chandelier which was obviously a fabulous worth for she had encased it in a holland bag i perceive ma'am said i to the stout maid that your master is in affluent circumstances she shook her head emphatically and said something that i failed to catch 
You wish to indicate, I hazarded, that he married a fortune? This time I caught the words, they were tinned meats, and having uttered them, she lapsed into gloomy silence. Nevertheless, I said, this room must have cost a pretty penny. She done it all herself, replied my new friend, with concentrated scorn. But this green floor, so beautifully stained, boiling oil, said she, with a flush of honest shame, and a shilling's worth of paint. Those rugs, remnants, she sighed, and showed me how artfully they had been pieced together. The curtains, remnants, at all events the sofa. She raised its drapery, and I saw that the sofa was built of packing cases. The desk. I really thought that I was safe this time, for could I not see the drawers with their brass handles, the charming shelf for books, and the pigeonholes with their coverings of silk? She made it out of three orange boxes, said the lady, at last a little awed herself. I looked around me despairingly, and my eye alighted on the holland covering. There is a fine chandelier in that holland bag, I said coaxingly. She sniffed, and was raising an untender hand. When I checked her, Forbear, ma'am, I cried with authority. I prefer to believe in that bag. How much to be pitied, ma'am, are those who have lost faith in everything. I think all the pretty things that the little nursery governess had made out of nothing squeezed my hand for letting the chandelier off. But good God, ma'am, said I to madam, what an exposure! She intimated that there were other exposures upstairs. So there is a stair, said I, and then suspiciously, did she make it? No, but how she had altered it. The stair led to Mary's bedroom, and I said I would not look at that, nor at the studio, which was a shed in the garden. Did she build the studio with her own hands? No, but how she had altered it. How she alters everything, I said. Do you think you are safe, ma'am? She thought a little under my obvious sympathy, and honored me with some of her views and confidences. The rental paid by Mary and her husband was not, it appeared, one on which any self-respecting domestic could reflect with pride. They got the house very cheap on the understanding that they were to vacate it promptly if anyone bought it for building purposes, and because they paid so little they had to submit to the indignity of the notice-board. Mary detested the words, this space to be sold, and had been known to shake her fist at them. She was as elated about her house as if it were a real house, and always trembled when any possible purchaser of spaces called. As I have told you my own aphorism, I feel I ought in fairness to record of this aggrieved servant. It was on the subject of art. The difficulty, she said, is not to paint pictures, but to get frames for them. A home thrust, this. She could not honestly say that she thought much of her master's work, nor apparently did any other person result tinned meats. Yes, one person thought a deal of it, or pretended to do so, was constantly flinging up her hands in delight over it, had even been caught whispering fiercely to a friend, Praise it, praise it, praise it. And this was when the painter was sunk in gloom. Never as I could well believe was such a one as Mary for luring a man back to cheerfulness. A dangerous woman, I said with a shudder, and fell to examining a painting over the mantel-shelf. It was a portrait of a man, and had impressed me favorably because it was framed. A friend of hers, my guide, informed me, but I never seed him. I would have turned away from it had not an inscription on the picture drawn me nearer. It was in a lady's handwriting, and these were the words, Fancy portrait of our dear unknown. Could it be meant for me? I cannot tell you how interested I suddenly became. It represented a very fine-looking fellow indeed, and not a day more than thirty. A friend of hers, ma'am, did you say? I asked quite shakily. How do you know that if you've never seen him? When Master was painting of it, she said, in the studio, he used to come running in here to say to her such like as, What color would you make his eyes? And her reply, ma'am, I asked eagerly. She said, Beautiful blue eyes. And he said, You wouldn't make it a handsome face, would you? And she says, A very handsome face. And says he, Middle-aged? And says she, Twenty-nine. And I mind him saying, A little bald on top? And she says, says she, Not at all. 
the dear grateful girl not to make me bald on the top i have seen her kiss her hand to that picture said the maid fancy mary kissing her hand to me oh the pretty love Pooh! i was staring at the picture cogitating what insulting message i could write on it when i heard the woman's voice again i think she has known him since she were a baby she was saying for this here was a present he give her she was on her knees drawing the doll's house from beneath the sofa where it had been hidden away and immediately i thought i shall slip this insulting message into this but i did not and i shall tell you why it was because the engaging toy had been redecorated by loving hands there were fresh gowns for all the inhabitants and the paint on the furniture was scarcely dry the little doll's house was almost ready for further use i looked at the maid but her face was expressionless put it back i said ashamed to have surprised mary's pretty secret and i left the house dejectedly with a profound conviction that the little nursery governess had hooked on to me again end of chapter three Chapter Four of the Little White Bird. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tribal Elder. The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry. Chapter Four. There came a night when the husband was alone in that street waiting. He can do nothing for you now, little nursery governess. You must fight it out by yourself. When there are great things to do in the house, the man must leave. Oh, man, selfish, indelicate, coarse-grained at the best, thy woman's hour has come. Get thee gone. He slouches from the house, always her true lover, I do believe, chivalrous, brave, a boy until to-night. But was he ever unkind to her? It is the unpardonable sin now. Is there the memory of an unkindness to stalk the street with him to-night? And if not an unkindness, still might he not sometimes have been a little kinder? Shall we make a new rule of life from to-night? Always to try to be a little kinder than is necessary? Poor youth, she would come to the window if she were able, I am sure, to sign that the one little unkindness is long forgotten to send you a reassuring smile till you and she meet again, and if you are not to meet again, still to send you a reassuring, trembling smile. Ah, no, that was for yesterday. It is too late now. He wanders the streets thinking of her to-night, but she has forgotten him. In her great hour the man is nothing to the woman. Their love is trivial now. He and I were on opposite sides of the street, now become familiar ground to both of us, and diverse pictures rose before me in which Mary A. walked. Here was the morning after my only entry into her house. The agent had promised me to have the obnoxious notice-board removed, but I apprehended that as soon as the letter announcing his intention reached her, she would remove it herself, and when I passed by in the morning, there she was on a chair and a footstool, pounding lustily at it with a hammer. When it fell, she gave it such a vicious little kick. There were the nights when her husband came out to watch for the postman. I suppose he was awaiting some letter big with the fate of a picture. He dogged the postman from door to door like an assassin or a guardian angel. Never had he the courage to ask if there was a letter for him. But almost as it fell into the box, he had it out and tore it open and then if the door closed despairingly, the woman who had been at the window all this time pressed her hand to her heart, but if the news was good, they might emerge presently and strut off arm in arm in the direction of the pork emporium. One last picture. On summer evenings I had caught glimpses of them through the open window, and when she sat at the piano, singing and playing to him, or, while she played with one hand, she flung out the other for him to grasp. She was so joyously happy, and she had such a romantic mind. I conceived her so sympathetic that she always laughed before he came to the joke, and I am sure she had filmy eyes from the very start of a pathetic story. And so, laughing and crying and haunted by whispers, 
the little nursery governess had gradually become another woman, glorified, mysterious. I suppose a man soon becomes used to the great change, and cannot recall a time when there were no babes sprawling in his Mary's face. I am trying to conceive what were the thoughts of the young husband on the other side of the street. If the barrier is to be crossed to-night, may I not go with her? She is not so brave as you think her. When she talked so gaily a few hours ago, oh my God, did she deceive even you? Plain questions to-night. Why should it all fall on her? What is the man that he should be flung out into the street in this terrible hour? You have not been fair to the man. Poor boy! His wife has quite forgotten him and his trumpery love. If she lives, she will come back to him, but if she dies, she will die triumphant and serene. Life and death, the child and the mother, are ever meeting as the one draws into harbour and the other sets sail. They exchange a bright, all's well, and pass on. But afterward? The only ghosts, I believe, who creep into this world are dead young mothers, return to see how their children fare. There is no other inducement great enough to bring the departed back. They glide into the acquainted room when day and night their jailers are in the grip, and whisper, How is it with you, my child? but always, lest a strange face should frighten him. They whisper it so low that he may not hear. They bend over him to see that he sleeps peacefully, and replace his sweet arm beneath the coverlet, and they open the drawers to count how many little vests he has. They love to do these things. What is saddest about ghosts is that they may not know their child. They expect him to be just as he was when they left him, and they are easily bewildered, and search for him from room to room, and hate the unknown boy that he has become. Poor, passionate souls! They may even do him an injury. These are the ghosts that go wailing about old houses, and foolish wild stories are invented to explain what is all so pathetic and simple. I know of a man who, after wandering far, returned to his early home to pass the evening of his days in it, and sometimes from his chair by the fire he saw the door open softly and a woman's face appear. She always looked at him very vindictively and then vanished. Strange things happened in this house. Windows were opened at night. The curtains of his bed were set fire to. A step on the stair was loosened. The cover of an old well in the corridor where he walked was cunningly removed, and when he fell ill, the wrong potion was put in the glass by his bedside, and he died. How could the pretty young mother know that this grizzled interloper was the child of whom she was in search? All our notions about ghosts are wrong. It is nothing so petty as lost wills or deeds of violence that brings them back, and we are not nearly so afraid of them as they are of us. One by one the lights of the street went out, but still a lamp burned steadily in the little window across the way. I know not how it happened, whether I had crossed first to him or he to me, but after being for a long time as the echo of each other's steps, we were together now. I can have had no desire to deceive him, but some reason was needed to account for my vigil, and I may have said something that he misconstrued, for above my words he was always listening for other sounds. But however it came about, he had conceived the idea that I was an outcast for a reason similar to his own, and I let his mistake pass. It seemed to matter so little and to draw us together so naturally. We talked together of many things, such as worldly ambition, for long ambition has been like an ancient memory to me, some glorious day recalled from my springtime. So much a thing of the past that I must make a railway journey to revisit it, as to look upon the pleasant fields in which that scene was laid. But he had been ambitious yesterday. I mentioned worldly ambition. Good. God, he said with a shudder. 
There was a clock hard by that struck the quarters, and one o'clock past, and two. What time is it now? Twenty past two. And now? It is still twenty past two. I asked him about his relatives, and neither he nor she had any. We have a friend, he began, and paused, and then rambled into a not very understandable story about a letter and a doll's house, and some unknown man who had bought one of his pictures, or was supposed to have done so, in a curiously clandestine manner. I could not quite follow the story. It is she who insists that it is always the same person, he said. She thinks he will make himself known to me if anything happens to her. His voice suddenly went husky. She told me, he said, if she died and I discovered him, to give him her love. At this we parted abruptly, as we did at intervals throughout the night, to drift together again presently. He tried to tell me of some things she had asked him to do, should she not get over this. But what they were I know not, for they engulfed him at the first step. He would draw back from them as ill-omened things, and next moment he was going over them to himself like a child at lessons. A child. In that short year she had made him entirely dependent on her. It is ever thus with women. Their first deliberate act is to make their husband helpless. There are few men happily married who can knock in a nail. But it was not of this that I was thinking. I was wishing I had not degenerated so much. Well, as you know, the little nursery governess did not die. At eighteen minutes to four we heard the rustle of David's wings. He boasts about it to this day, and has the hour to a syllable, as if the first thing he ever did was to look at the clock. An oldish gentleman had opened the door and waved congratulations to my companion, who immediately butted at me, drove me against a wall, hesitated for a second with his head down, as if in doubt whether to toss me, and then rushed away. I followed slowly. I shook him by the hand, but by this time he was haw-haw-hawing so abominably that a disgust of him swelled up within me, and with it a passionate desire to jeer once more at Mary A. "'It is little she will care for you now,' I said to the fellow. "'I know the sort of woman.' Her intellectuals, which are all she has to distinguish her from the brutes, are so imperfectly developed that she will be a crazy thing about that boy for the next three years. She has no longer occasion for you, my dear sir. You are like a picture, painted out. But I question whether he heard me. I returned to my home. Home, as if one alone can build a nest. How often as I have ascended the stairs that lead to my lonely, sumptuous rooms, have I paused to listen to the hilarity of the servants below. That morning I could not rest. I wandered from chamber to chamber, followed by my great dog, and all were alike empty and desolate. I had nearly finished a cigar when I thought I heard a pebble strike the window, and looking out I saw David's father standing beneath. I had told him that I lived in this street, and I suppose my lights had guided him to my window. I could not lie down, he called up hoarsely, until I heard your news. Is it all right? For a moment I failed to understand him. Then I said sourly, Yes, it is all right. Both doing well? he inquired. Both, I answered, and all the time I was trying to shut the window. It was undoubtedly a kindly impulse that had brought him out, but I was nevertheless in a passion with him. Boy or girl, persisted the dodderer, with ungentlemanlike curiosity. Boy, I said very furiously. Splendid, he called out, and I think he added something else. But by that time I had closed the window with a slam. End of chapter 4《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッ
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Alondra The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry Chapter 5 Chapter 5 The Fight for Timothy Mary's poor pretentious babe screamed continually with a note of exultation in his din, as if he thought he was devoting himself to a life of pleasure, and often the last sound I heard as I got me out of the street was his haw-haw-haw, delivered triumphantly, as if it were some entirely new thing, though he must have learned it like a parrot. I had not one tear for the woman, but poor father, thought I, to know that every time your son is happy you are betrayed. Phew! A nauseous draught. I have the acquaintance of a deliciously pretty girl, who is always sulky, and the thoughtless beseech her to be bright, not witting wherein lies her heroism. She was born the merriest of maids, but, being a student of her face, learned anon that sulkiness best becomes it, and so she has struggled and prevailed. A Woman's History Brave Margaret, when night falls and thy hair is down, dost thou return, I wonder, to thy natural state, or, dreading the shadow of indulgence, sleepest thou even sulkily? But will a male child do as much for his father? This remains to be seen, and so, after waiting several months, I decided to buy David a rocking horse. My St. Bernard dog accompanied me, though I have always been diffident of taking him to toy shops, which over-excite him. Hitherto, the toys I had bought had always been for him, and as we durst not admit this to the saleswoman, we were both horribly self-conscious when in the shop. A score of times I have told him that he had much better not come. I have announced fiercely that he is not to come. He then lets go of his legs, which is how a St. Bernard sits down, making the noise of a sack of coals suddenly deposited, and laying his head between his front paws, stares at me through the red haws that make his eyes so mournful. He will do this for an hour without blinking, for he knows that in time it will unman me. My dog knows very little, but what little he does know, he knows extraordinarily well. One can get out of my chambers by a back way, and I sometimes steal softly, but I can't help looking back, and there he is, and there are those whores asking sorrowfully, Is this worthy of you? Curse you, I say, get your hat, or words to that effect. He has even been to the club, where he waddles up the stairs so exactly like some respected member, that he makes everybody most uncomfortable. I forget how I became possessor of him. I think I cut him out of an old number of punch. He cost me as much as an eight-roomed cottage in the country. He was a full-grown dog when I first, most foolishly, introduced him to toys. I had bought a toy in the street for my own amusement. It represented a woman, a young mother, flinging her little son over her head with one hand and catching him in the other, and I was entertaining myself on the hearth-rug with this pretty domestic scene when I heard an unwanted sound from Porthos, and looking up I saw that noble and melancholic countenance on the broad grin. I shuddered and was for putting the toy away at once, but he sternly struck down my arm with his and signed that I was to continue. The unmanly chuckle always came, I found, when the poor lady dropped her babe, but the whole thing entranced him. He tried to keep his excitement down by taking huge draughts of water. He forgot all his niceties of conduct. He sat in holy rapture with the toy between his paws, took it to bed with him, ate it in the night, and searched for it so longingly next day that I had to go out and buy him the man with the scythe. After that we had everything of note, the boot black boy, the topo with bottle, the woolly rabbit that squeaks when you hold it in your mouth, 
they all vanished as inexplicably as the lady. But I dared not tell him my suspicions, for he suspected also, and his gentle heart would have mourned had I confirmed his fears. The dame in the temple of toys, which we frequent, thinks I want them for a little boy, and calls him the precious and the lamb, the while Porthos is standing gravely by my side. She is a motherly soul, but over-talkative. And how is the dear lamb today? she begins, beaming. Well, ma'am, well, I say, keeping tight grip of his collar. This blighty weather is not affecting his darling appetite. No, ma'am, not at all. She would be considerably surprised if informed that he dined today on a sheep's head, a loaf, and three cabbages, and is suspected of a leg of mutton. I hope he loves his toys. He carries them about with him everywhere, ma'am. Has the one we bought yesterday with him now, though you might not think it to look at him. What do you say to a box of tools this time? I think not, ma'am. Is the deary fond of digging? Very partial to digging. We shall find the leg of mutton some day. Then perhaps a weeny spade and a pail. She got me to buy a model of Canterbury Cathedral once. She was so insistent, and Porthos gave me his mind about it when we got home. He detests the kindergarten system, and as she is absurdly prejudiced in its favour, we have had to try other shops. We went to the Lowther Arcade for the rocking horse. Dear Lowther Arcade, oft times have we wandered agape among thy enchanted palaces, Porthos and I, David and I, David and Porthos and I. I have heard that thou art vulgar, but I cannot see how, unless it be that tattered children haunt thy portals, those awful yet smiling entrances to so much joy. To the arcade there are two entrances, and with much to be sung in laudation of that which opens from the strand, I yet on the whole prefer the other, as the more truly romantic, because it is there the tattered ones congregate, waiting to see the Davids emerge with the magic lamp. We have always a penny for them, and I have known them, before entering the arcade with it, retire, but whither, to wash, surely the prettiest of all the compliments that are paid to the home of toys. And now, O oh arcade, so much fairer than thy West End brother, we are told that thou art doomed, anon to be turned into an eating-house, or a hive for usurers, something rankly useful. All thy delights are under notice to quit. The Noah's arks are packed one within the other, with clockwork horses harnessed to them. The soldiers, knapsack on back, are kissing their hands to the dear foolish girls, who, however, will not be left behind them. All the four-footed things gather around the elephant, who is over full of drawing-room furniture. The birds flutter their wings. The man with the scythe mows his way through the crowd. The balloons tug at their strings. The ships rock under a swell of sail. Everything is getting ready for the mighty exodus into the strand. Tears will be shed. So we bought the horse in the Lowther Arcade. Porthos, who thought it was for him, looking proud but uneasy, and it was sent to the bandbox house anonymously. About a week afterward I had the ill luck to meet Mary as a husband in Kensington, so I asked him what he had called his little girl. It is a boy, he replied with intolerable good humour. We call him David. And then, with a singular lack of taste, he wanted the name of my boy. I flicked my glove. Timothy, said I. I saw a suppressed smile on his face and said hotly that Timothy was as good a name as David. I like it, he assured me, and expressed a hope that they would become friends. I boiled to say that I really could not allow Timothy to mix with boys of the David class, but I refrained and listened coldly while he told me what David did when you said his toes were pigs going to market or returning from it, I forget which. He also boasted of David's weight, a subject about which we are uncommonly touchy at the club, 
as if children were for throwing forth a wager. But no more about Timothy. Gradually this vexed me. I felt what a forlorn little chap Timothy was, with no one to say a word for him, and I became his champion and hinted something about teething, but withdrew it when it seemed too surprising, and tried to get on to safer ground, such as bibs and general intelligence. But the painter fellow was so willing to let me have my say, and knew so much more about babies than is fitting for men to know, that I paled before him, and wondered why the deuce he was listening to me so attentively. You may remember a story he had told me about some anonymous friend. His latest, said he now, is to send David a rocking horse. I must say I could see no reason for his mirth. Picture it, said he, a rocking horse for a child not three months old. I was about to say fiercely, the stirrups are adjustable, but thought it best to laugh with him. But I was pained to hear that Mary had laughed, though heaven knows I have often laughed at her. But women are odd, he said unexpectedly and explained. It appears that in the middle of her merriment, Mary had become grave and said to him quite haughtily, I see nothing to laugh at. Then she had kissed the horse solemnly on the nose and said, I wish he was here to see me do it. There are moments when one cannot help feeling a drawing to Mary. But moments only, for the next thing he said put her in a particularly odious light. He informed me that she had sworn to hunt Mr. Anon down. She won't succeed, I said, sneering but nervous. Then it will be her first failure, said he. But she knows nothing about the man. You would not say that if you heard her talking of him. She says he is a gentle, whimsical, lonely old bachelor. Old, I cried. Well, what she says is that he will soon be old if he doesn't take care. He is a bachelor at all events and is very fond of children, but has never had one to play with. Could not play with a child, though there was one, I said brusquely. Has forgotten the way, could stand and stare only. Yes, if the parents were present, but he thinks that if he were alone with the child, he could come out strong. How the deuce, I began. That is what she says, he explained apologetically. I think she will prove to be too clever for him. Pooh, I said, but undoubtedly I felt a dizziness, and the next time I met him he quite frightened me. Do you happen to know anyone, he said, who has a St. Bernard dog? No, said I, picking up my stick. He has a St. Bernard dog. How have you found that out? She has found it out. But how? I don't know. I left him at once, for Porthos was but a little ways behind me. The mystery of it scared me, but I armed promptly for battle. I engaged a boy to walk Porthos in Kensington Gardens, and gave him these instructions. Should you find yourself followed by a young woman, wheeling a second-hand perambulator, instantly hand her over to the police, on the charge of attempting to steal the dog. Now then, Mary. By the way, her husband said at our next meeting, that rocking horse I told you of cost three guineas. She has gone to the shop to ask? No, not to ask that, but for a description of the purchaser's appearance. Oh, Mary, Mary. Here is the appearance of purchaser as supplied at the arcade. Looked like a military gentleman. Tall, dark, and rather dressy. Fine Roman nose, quite so. Carefully trimmed moustache, going grey. Not at all. Hair thin and thoughtfully distributed over the head, like fiddle strings. As if to make the most of it. Pa! dusted chair with handkerchief before sitting down on it, and had other old maidish ways. I should like to know what they are. Tediously polite, but no talker. 
bored face, age forty-five if a day, a lie, was accompanied by an enormous yellow dog with sore eyes. They always think the whores are sore eyes. Do you know anyone who is like that? Mary's husband asked me innocently. My dear man, I said, I know almost no one who is not like that. And it was true. So like each other do we grow at the club. I was pleased on the whole with this talk, for it at least showed me how she had come to know of the St. Bernard, but anxiety returned when one day from behind my curtains I saw Mary in my street with an inquiring eye on the windows. She stopped a nurse who was carrying a baby and went into pretended ecstasies over it. I was sure she also asked whether by any chance it was called Timothy and if not, whether that nurse knew any other nurse who had charge of a Timothy. Obviously, Mary suspicioned me, but nevertheless, I clung to Timothy, though I wished fervently that I knew more about him. For I still met that other father occasionally, and he always stopped to compare notes about the boys, and the questions he asked were so intimate. How Timothy slept how he woke up, how he fell off again, what we put in his bath. It is well that dogs and little boys have so much in common, for it was really of Porthos, I told him, how he slept, peacefully, how he woke up, supposed to be subject to dreams, how he fell off again, with one little hand on his nose. But I glided past what we put in his bath, carbolic and a mop, the man had not the least suspicion of me, and I thought it reasonable to hope that Mary would prove as generous. Yet was I straightened in my mind, for it might be that she was only biding her time to strike suddenly, and this attached me the more to Timothy, as if I feared she might soon snatch him from me, as was indeed to be the case. End of chapter 5 Chapter 5. The Fight for Timothy Chapter 6. Of the Little White Bird This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Alondra The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry Chapter 6. Chapter 6. A Shock It was on a May Day, and I saw Mary accompany her husband as far as the first crossing, whence she waved him out of sight, as if he had boarded an Atlantic liner. All this time she wore the face of a woman happily married, who meant to go straight home, there to await her lord's glorious return, and the military-looking gentleman watching her with a bored smile saw nothing better before him than a chapter on the domestic felicities. Oh, Mary, can you not provide me with the tiniest little plot? Hello! No sooner was she hid from him than she changed into another woman. She was now become a calculating, purposeful madam, who looked around her covertly, and having shrunk in size in order to appear less noticeable, set off nervously on some mysterious adventure. The deuce, thought I, and followed her. Like one anxious to keep an appointment, she frequently consulted her watch, looking long at it, as if it were one of those watches that do not give up their secret until you have made a mental calculation. Once she kissed it. I had always known that she was fond of her cheap little watch, which he gave her, I think, on the day I dropped the letter. But why kiss it in the street? Ah, and why then replace it so hurriedly in your leather belt, Mary, as if it were guilt to you to kiss today, or any day, the watch your husband gave you? It will be seen that I had made a very rapid journey from light thoughts to uneasiness. 
I wanted no plot by the time she reached her destination, a street of tawdry shops. She entered none of them, but paced slowly and shrinking from observation up and down the street, a very figure of shame, and never had I thought to read shame in the sweet face of Mary A. Had I crossed to her and pronounced her name, I think it would have felled her, and yet she remained there, waiting. I too was waiting for him, wondering if this was the man, or this, or this, and I believe I clutched my stick. Did I suspect Mary? Oh, surely, not for a moment of time, but there was some foolishness here. She was come without the knowledge of her husband, as her furtive manner indicated, to a meeting she dreaded and was ashamed to tell him of. She was come into danger, then it must be to save, not herself, but him. The folly to be concealed could never have been Mary's. Yet what could have happened in the past of that honest boy, from the consequences of which she might shield him by skulking here? Could that laugh of his have survived a dishonour? The open forehead, the curly locks, the pleasant smile, the hundred ingratiating ways which we carry with us out of childhood, they may all remain when the innocence has fled. But surely the laugh of the morning of life must go. I have never known the devil retain his grip on that. But Mary was still waiting. She was no longer beautiful. Shame had possession of her face. She was an ugly woman. Then the entanglement was her husband's, and I cursed him for it. But without conviction, for, after all, what did I know of women? I have some distant memories of them, some vain inventions. But of men, I have known one man indifferent well for over forty years, have exulted in him, odd to think of it, shuddered at him, wearied of him, been willing, God forgive me, to jog along with him tolerantly long after I have found him out. I know something of men, and on my soul, boy, I believe I am wronging you. Then Mary is here for some innocent purpose, to do a good deed that were better undone, as it so scares her. Turn back, you foolish soft heart, and I shall say no more about it. Obstinate one, you saw the look on your husband's face as he left you. It is the studio light by which he paints, and still sees to hope, despite all the disappointments of his not ignoble ambitions. That light is the dower you brought him, and he is a wealthy man if it does not flicker. So anxious to be gone, and yet she would not go. Several times she made little darts, as if at last resolved to escape from that detestable street, and faltered and returned like a bird to the weasel. Again she looked at her watch and kissed it. Oh, Mary, take flight! What madness is this? Woman, be gone! Suddenly she was gone. With one mighty effort and a last terrified look round, she popped into a pawn-shop. Long before she emerged, I understood it all. I think even as the door rang and closed on her, why the timid soul had sought a street where she was unknown, why she crept so many times past that abhorred shop before desperately venturing in, why she looked so often at the watch she might never see again. So desperately cumbered was Mary to keep her little house over her head, and yet the brave heart was retaining a smiling face for her husband, who must not even know where her little treasures were going. It must seem monstrously cruel of me, but I was now quite light-hearted again. Even when Mary fled from the shop where she had left her watch, and I had peace of mind to note how thin and worn she had become, as if her baby was grown too big for her slight arms, even then I was light-hearted. Without attempting to follow her, I sauntered homeward, humming a snatch of song with a great deal of fal de lal de riddle in it, for I can never remember words. 
I saw her enter another shop, baby linen shop or some nonsense of that sort, so it was plain for what she had popped her watch. But what cared I? I continued to sing most beautifully. I lunged gaily with my stick at a lamp post and missed it, whereat a street urchin grinned, and I winked at him and slipped tuppence down his back. I presume I would have chosen the easy way had time been given me, but fate willed that I should meet the husband on his homeward journey, and his first remark inspired me to a folly. How is Timothy? he asked, and the question opened a way so attractive that I think no one whose dull life craves for colour could have resisted it. He is no more, I replied impulsively. The painter was so startled that he gave utterance to a very oath of pity, and I felt a sinking myself, for in these hasty words my little boy was gone. Indeed, all my bright dreams of Timothy, all my efforts to shelter him from Mary's scorn, went whistling down the wind. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Little White Bird This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Alondra The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry Chapter 7 Chapter 7 A Shock it was on a May day, and I saw Mary accompany her husband as far as the first crossing, whence she waved him out of sight, as if he had boarded an Atlantic liner. All this time she wore the face of a woman happily married, who meant to go straight home, there to await her lord's glorious return. And the military-looking gentleman watching her with a bored smile saw nothing better before him than a chapter on the domestic felicities. Oh, Mary, can you not provide me with the tiniest little plot? Hello! No sooner was she hid from him than she changed into another woman. She was now become a calculating, purposeful madam, who looked around her covertly, and having shrunk in size in order to appear less noticeable, set off nervously on some mysterious adventure. The deuce, thought I, and followed her. Like one anxious to keep an appointment, she frequently consulted her watch, looking long at it, as if it were one of those watches that do not give up their secret until you have made a mental calculation. Once she kissed it. I had always known that she was fond of her cheap little watch, which he gave her, I think, on the day I dropped the letter. But why kiss it in the street? Ah, and why then replace it so hurriedly in your leather belt, Mary, as if it were guilt to you to kiss today, or any day, the watch your husband gave you? It will be seen that I had made a very rapid journey from light thoughts to uneasiness. I wanted no plot by the time she reached her destination, a street of tawdry shops. She entered none of them, but paced slowly and shrinking from observation up and down the street, a very figure of shame, and never had I thought to read shame in the sweet face of Mary A. Had I crossed to her and pronounced her name, I think it would have felled her, and yet she remained there, waiting. I too was waiting for him, wondering if this was the man, or this, or this, and I believe I clutched my stick. Did I suspect Mary? Oh, surely, not for a moment of time, but there was some foolishness here. She was come without the knowledge of her husband, as her furtive manner indicated, to a meeting she dreaded and was ashamed to tell him of. She was come into danger, then it must be to save, not herself but him. The folly to be concealed could never have been Mary's. Yet what could have happened in the past of that honest boy, from the consequences of which she might shield him by skulking here? 
Could that laugh of his have survived a dishonour? The open forehead, the curly locks, the pleasant smile, the hundred ingratiating ways which we carry with us out of childhood, they may all remain when the innocence has fled. But surely the laugh of the morning of life must go. I have never known the devil retain his grip on that. But Mary was still waiting. She was no longer beautiful. Shame had possession of her face. She was an ugly woman. Then the entanglement was her husband's, and I cursed him for it. But without conviction, for, after all, what did I know of women? I have some distant memories of them, some vain inventions. But of men, I have known one man indifferent well for over forty years, have exulted in him, odd to think of it, shuddered at him, wearied of him, been willing, God forgive me, to jog along with him tolerantly, long after I have found him out. I know something of men, and on my soul, boy, I believe I am wronging you. Then Mary is here for some innocent purpose, to do a good deed that were better undone, as it so scares her. Turn back, you foolish soft heart, and I shall say no more about it. Obstinate one, you saw the look on your husband's face as he left you. It is the studio light by which he paints, and still sees to hope, despite all the disappointments of his not ignoble ambitions. That light is the dower you brought him, and he is a wealthy man if it does not flicker. So anxious to be gone, and yet she would not go. Several times she made little darts, as if at last resolved to escape from that detestable street, and faltered and returned like a bird to the weasel. Again she looked at her watch and kissed it. Oh, Mary, take flight! What madness is this? Woman, be gone! Suddenly she was gone. With one mighty effort and a last terrified look round, she popped into a pawn shop. Long before she emerged, I understood it all. I think even as the door rang and closed on her, why the timid soul had sought a street where she was unknown, why she crept so many times past that abhorred shop before desperately venturing in, why she looked so often at the watch she might never see again. So desperately cumbered was Mary to keep her little house over her head, and yet the brave heart was retaining a smiling face for her husband, who must not even know where her little treasures were going. It must seem monstrously cruel of me, but I was now quite light-hearted again. Even when Mary fled from the shop where she had left her watch, and I had peace of mind to note how thin and worn she had become, as if her baby was grown too big for her slight arms, even then I was light-hearted. Without attempting to follow her, I sauntered homeward, humming a snatch of song with a great deal of fal de lal de riddle in it, for I can never remember words. I saw her enter another shop, baby linen shop or some nonsense of that sort, so it was plain for what she had popped her watch. But what cared I? I continued to sing most beautifully. I lunged gaily with my stick at a lamp-post and missed it, whereat a street urchin grinned, and I winked at him and slipped tuppence down his back. I presume I would have chosen the easy way had time been given me, but fate willed that I should meet the husband on his homeward journey, and his first remark inspired me to a folly. How is Timothy? he asked, and the question opened a way so attractive that I think no one whose dull life craves for colour could have resisted it. He is no more, I replied impulsively. The painter was so startled that he gave utterance to a very oath of pity, and I felt a sinking myself, for in these hasty words my little boy was gone. Indeed, all my bright dreams of Timothy, all my efforts to shelter him from Mary's scorn, 
went whistling down the wind. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Little White Bird This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry Chapter 8 Chapter 8 The Inconsiderate Waiter they were the family of William, one of our club waiters, who had been disappointing me grievously of late. Many a time have I deferred dining several minutes that I might have the attendance of this ingrate. His efforts to reserve the window table for me were satisfactory, and I used to allow him privileges, as to suggest dishes. I have given him information as that someone had startled me in the reading-room by slamming a door. I have shown him how I cut my finger with a piece of string. William was none of your assertive waiters. We could have plotted a murder safely before him. It was one member who said to him that Saucy Sarah would win the derby, and another who said that Saucy Sarah had no chance. But it was William who agreed with both. The excellent fellow as I thought him, was like a cheroot which may be smoked from either end. I date his lapse from one evening when I was dining by the window. I had to repeat my order. Deviled kidney, and instead of answering brightly, yes, sir, as if my selection of deviled kidney was a personal gratification to him, which is the manner one expects of a waiter, he gazed eagerly out at the window, and then, starting, asked, "'Did you say devil kidney, sir?' A few minutes afterward I became aware that someone was leaning over the back of my chair, and you may conceive my indignation on discovering that this rude person was William. Let me tell, in the measured words of one describing a past incident, what next took place.' To get nearer the window, he pressed heavily on my shoulder. William, I said, you are not attending to me. To be fair to him, he shook, but never shall I forget his audacious apology. Beg pardon, sir, but I was thinking of something else. And immediately his eyes resought the window, and this burst from him passionately. For God's sake, sir, as we are man and man, Tell me if you have seen a little girl looking up at the club windows. Man and man? But he had been a good waiter once, so I pointed out the girl to him. As soon as she saw William, she ran into the middle of Pall Mall, regardless of hansoms, many of which seemed to pass over her, nodded her head significantly three times, and then disappeared, probably on a stretcher. She was the tawdriest little Arab of about ten years, but seemed to have brought relief to William. Thank God, said he fervently, and in the worst taste. I was as much horrified as if he had dropped a plate on my toes. Bread, William, I said sharply. You are not vexed with me, sir, he had the hardihood to whisper. It was a liberty, I said. I know, sir, but I was beside myself. That was a liberty again. It is my wife, sir, she... So William, whom I had favoured in so many ways, was a married man. I felt that this was the greatest liberty of all. I gathered that the troublesome woman was ailing, and as one who likes after dinner to believe that there is no distress in the world, I desired to be told by William that the signals meant her return to health. He answered inconsiderately, however, that the doctor feared the worst. Bah, the doctor, I said in a rage. Yes, sir, said William. What is her confounded ailment? She was Alice, one of the delicate kind, but full of spirit. And you see, sir, she has had a baby girl lately. William, how dare you, I said. But in the same moment... I saw that this father might be useful to me. How does your baby sleep, William? I asked in a low voice, 
How does she wake up? What do you put in her bath? I saw surprise in his face, so I hurried on without waiting for an answer. That little girl comes here with a message from your wife. Yes, sir, every evening she's my eldest, and three nods from her means that the missus is a little better. There were three nods today? Yes, sir. I suppose you live in some low part, William. The impudent fellow looked as if he could have struck me. Off Drury Lane he said, flushing, but it isn't low. And now, he groaned, she's afeard she will die without my being there to hold her hand. She should not say such things. She never says them, sir. She always pretends to be feeling stronger, but I know what is in her mind when I am leaving the house in the morning, for then she looks at me from her bed, and I looks at her from the door. Oh, my God, sir! William! At last he saw that I was angry, and it was characteristic of him to beg my pardon and withdraw his wife as if she were some unsuccessful dish. I tried to forget his vulgar story in billiards, but he had spoiled my game, and the next day to punish him I gave my orders through another waiter. As I had the window seat, however, I could not but see that the little girl was late and though this mattered nothing to me, and I had finished my dinner, I lingered till she came. She not only nodded three times, but waved her hat, and I arose. Having now finished my dinner, William came stealthily toward me. Her temperature has gone down, sir, he said, rubbing his hands together. To whom are you referring? I asked coldly, and retired to the billiard room, where I played a capital game. I took pains to show William that I had forgotten his maunderings, but I observed the girl nightly, and once, instead of nodding, she shook her head, and that evening I could not get into a pocket. Next evening there was no William in the dining room, and I thought I knew what had happened. But chancing to enter the library rather miserably, I was surprised to see him on a ladder dusting books. We had the room practically to ourselves, for though several members sat on chairs holding books in their hands, they were all asleep, and William descended the ladder to tell me his blasting tale. He had sworn at a member. I hardly knew what I was doing all day, sir, for I had left her so weakly that I stamped my foot. I beg your pardon for speaking of her, he had the grace to say, but Irene had promised to come every two hours, and when she came about four o'clock, and I saw she was crying, it sort of blinded me, sir, and I stumbled against a member, Mr. B, and he said, Damn you! Well, sir, I had but touched him after all, and I was so broken it sort of stung me to be treated so, and I lost my senses, and I said, Damn you! His shamed head sank on his chest, and I think some of the readers shuddered in their sleep. I was turned out of the dining room at once, and sent here until the committee had decided what to do with me. Oh, sir, I am willing to go on my knees to Mr. B. How could I but despise a fellow who would be thus abject for a pound a week? For if I have to tell her I have lost my place, she will just fall back and die. I forbid your speaking to me of that woman, I cried wryly, unless you can speak pleasantly. And I left him to his fate and went off to look for B. What is this story about your swearing at one of the waiters? I asked him. You mean about his swearing at me, said B, reddening. I am glad that was it, I said for I could not believe you guilty of such bad form. The version which reached me was that you swore at each other, and that he was to be dismissed, and you reprimanded. Who told you that? asked B, who is a timid man. I am on the committee, I replied lightly, and proceeded to talk of other matters. But presently B, who had been reflecting, said, do you know, I fancy I was wrong in thinking that the waiter swore at me, and I shall withdraw the charge tomorrow. I was pleased to find that William's troubles were near an end, 
without my having to interfere in his behalf, and I then remembered that he would not be able to see the girl Irene from the library windows, which are at the back of the club. I was looking down at her, but she refrained from signalling, because she could not see William, and irritated by her stupidity, I went out and asked her how her mother was. My, she ejaculated after a long scrutiny of me, I believe you are one of them. And she gazed at me with delighted awe. I suppose William tells them of our splendid doings. The invalid, it appeared, was a bit better, and this annoying child wanted to inform William that she had took all the tapioca. She was to indicate this by licking an imaginary plate in the middle of Pall Mall. I gave the little vulgarian a shilling and returned to the club, disgusted. By the way, William, I said, Mr. B. is to inform the committee that he was mistaken in thinking you used improper language to him, so you will doubtless be restored to the dining room tomorrow. I had to add immediately, remember your place, William. But Mr. B. knows I swore, he insisted. A gentleman, I replied stiffly, cannot remember for many hours what a waiter has said to him. No, sir, but to stop him I had to say, And, ah, William, your wife is decidedly better. She has eaten the tapioca, all of it. How can you know, sir? By an accident. Irene signed to the window? No. Then you saw her and went out. How dare you, William? Oh, sir, to do that for me, may God bless William! He was reinstated in the dining room, but often when I looked at him, I seemed to see a dying wife in his face, and so the relations between us were still strained. But I watched the girl, and her pantomime was so illuminating that I knew the sufferer had again cleaned the platter on Tuesday, had attempted a boiled egg on Wednesday, you should have seen Irene chipping it in Pall Mall and putting in the salt, but was in a woeful state of relapse on Thursday. Is your mother very ill today, Miss Irene? I asked, as soon as I had drawn her out of range at the club windows. My, she exclaimed again, and I saw an ecstatic look pass between her and a still smaller girl with her, whom she referred to as a neighbour. I waited coldly. William's wife, I was informed, had looked like nothing but a dead one till she got the brandy. Hush, child, I said, shocked. You don't know how the dead look. Bless you, she replied. Assisted by her friend, who was evidently enormously impressed by Irene's intimacy with me, she gave me a good deal of miscellaneous information, as that William's real name was Mr. Hicking, but that he was known in their street because of the number of his shirts, as Toff Hicking. That the street held he should get away from the club before two in the morning, for his missus needed him more than the club needed him. That William replied, very sensibly, that if the club was short of waiters at supper time, some of the gentlemen might be kept waiting for their marabone. That he sat up with his missus most of the night, and pretended to her that he got some nice long naps at the club, that what she talked to him about mostly was the kid, that the kid was in another part of London, in charge of a person called the old woman, because there was an epidemic in Irene's street. And what does the doctor say about your mother? He sometimes said she would have a chance if she could get her kid back. Nonsense! and if she was took to the country. Then why does not William take her? My, and if she drank porty wine? Doesn't she? No, but father, he tells her, about how the gentleman drinks it. I turned from her with relief, but she came after me. Ain't you going to do it this time? She demanded with a falling face. You done it last time. I told her you done it. She pointed to her friend, 
who was looking wistfully at me. Ain't you to let her see you doing of it? For a moment I thought that her desire was another shilling, but by a piece of pantomime she showed that she wanted me to lift my hat to her. So I lifted it, and when I looked behind she had her head in the air, and her neighbour was gazing at her awestruck. These little creatures are really not without merit. About a week afterward I was in a hard landau, holding a newspaper before my face, lest anyone should see me in company of a waiter and his wife. William was taking her into Surrey to stay with an old nurse of mine, and Irene was with us, wearing the most outrageous bonnet. I formed a mean opinion of Mrs. Hicking's intelligence from her pride in the baby, which was a very ordinary one. She created a regrettable scene when it was brought to her because she had feared it would not know her again. I could have told her that they know no one for years had I not been in terror of Irene, who dandled the child on her knees and talked to it all the way. I have never known a bolder little hussy than this Irene. She asked the infant improper questions such as, Who no gave me this bonnet? and answered them herself. It was the pretty gentleman there, and several times I had to affect sleep, because she announced, Kitty wants to kiss the pretty gentleman. Irksome as all this necessarily was to a man of taste, I suffered still more acutely when we reached our destination, where disagreeable circumstances compelled me to drink tea with a waiter's family. William knew that I regarded thanks from a person's of his class as an outrage, yet he looked them though he dared not speak them. Hardly had he sat down at the table by my orders than he remembered that I was a member of the club and jumped up. Nothing is in worse form than whispering. Yet again and again he whispered to his poor foolish wife, How are you now? You don't feel faint? And when she said she felt like another woman already, his face charged me with the change. I could not but conclude from the way she let the baby pound her that she was stronger than she pretended. I remained longer than was necessary because I had something to say to William, which I feared he would misunderstand. But when he announced that it was time for him to catch a train back to London, at which his wife paled, I delivered the message. William, I said, backing away from him, the head waiter asked me to say that you could take a fortnight's holiday. Your wages will be paid as usual. Confound him! William, I cried furiously, go away! Then I saw his wife signing to him, and I knew she wanted to be left alone with me. William, I cried in a panic, stay where you are! But he was gone and I was alone with a woman whose eyes were filmy. Her class are fond of scenes. If you please, ma'am, I said imploringly. But she kissed my hand. She was like a little dog. It can be only the memory of some woman, said she, that makes you so kind to me and mine. Memory was the word she used, as if all my youth were fled. I suppose I really am quite elderly. I should like to know her name, sir, she said, that I may mention her with loving respect in my prayers. I raised the woman and told her the name. It was not Mary, but she has a home, I said, as you have, and I have none. Perhaps, ma'am, it would be better worth your while to mention me. It was this woman, now in health, whom I entrusted with the purchase of the outfits. One for a boy of six months, I explained to her, and one for a boy of a year, for the painter had boasted to me of David's rapid growth. I think she was a little surprised to find that both outfits were for the same house, and she certainly betrayed an ignoble curiosity about the mother's Christian name, but she was much easier to browbeat than a fine lady would have been, and I am sure she and her daughter enjoyed themselves hugely in the shops from one of which I shall never forget, Irene emerging proudly with a commissionaire who conducted her under an umbrella to the cab where I was lying in wait. 
I think that was the most celestial walk of Irene's life. I told Mrs. Hicking to give the articles a little active ill-treatment that they might not look quite new, at which she exclaimed, not being in my secret, and then to forward them to me. I then sent them to Mary and rejoiced in my devilish cunning all the evening, but chagrin came in the morning with a letter from her, which showed she knew all, that I was her Mr. Anon, and that there never had been a Timothy. I think I was never so gravelled. Even now I don't know how she had contrived it. Her cleverness raised such a demon in me that I locked away her letter at once, and have seldom read it since. No married lady should have indicted such an epistle to a single man. It said, with other things, which I decline to repeat, that I was her good fairy. As a sample of the deliberate falsehoods in it, I may mention that she said David loved me already. She hoped that I would come in often to see her husband, who was very proud of my friendship, and suggested that I should pay him my first visit today, at three o'clock an hour at which, as I happen to know, he was always away giving a painting lesson. In short, she wanted first to meet me alone, so that she might draw the delicious, respectful romance out of me, and afterward repeat it to him, with sighs and little peeps at him over her pocket handkerchief. She had dropped what were meant to look like two tears for me upon the paper, but I should not wonder, though, they were only artful drops of water. I sent her a stiff and tart reply, declining to hold any communication with her. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Little White Bird This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry Chapter 9 Chapter 9 A Confirmed Spinster I am in danger, I see, of being included among the whimsical fellows, which I so little desire that I have got me into my writing chair to combat the charge. But, having sat for an unconscionable time with pen poised, I am come agitatedly to the fear that there may be something in it. So long a time has elapsed, you must know, since I abated of the ardours of self-inquiry, that I revert in vain, through many rusty doors, for the beginning of this change in me if changed I am. I seem ever to see the same man until I am back in those wonderful months, which were half of my life, when, indeed, I know that I was otherwise than I am now. No whimsical fellow then. For that was one of the possibilities I put to myself while seeking for the explanation of things, and found to be inadmissible. Having failed in those days to discover why I was driven from the garden, I suppose I ceased to be enamoured of myself, as of some dull puzzle, and then perhaps the whimsicalities began to collect unnoticed. It is a painful thought to me tonight that he could wake up glorious once, this man in the elbow chair by the fire, who is humorously known at the club as a confirmed spinster. I remember him well when his years told four and twenty, on my soul the proudest subaltern of my acquaintance, and with the most reason to be proud. There was nothing he might not do in the future, having already done the biggest thing, this toddler up club steps today. Not indeed that I am a knave, I am tolerably kind, I believe, and most inoffensive, a gentleman, I trust, even in the eyes of the ladies who smile at me as we converse. They are an ever-increasing number, or so it seems to me tonight. Ah, ladies, I forget when I first began to notice that smile and to be made uneasy by it. 
I think I understand it now, and in some vague way it hurts me. I find that I watch for it nowadays, but I hope I am still your loyal, obedient servant. You will scarcely credit it, but I have just remembered that I once had a fascinating smile of my own. What has become of my smile? I swear I have not noticed that it was gone till now. I am like one who, revisiting his school, feels suddenly for his old knife. I first heard of my smile from another boy, whose sisters had considered all the smiles they knew and placed mine on top. My friend was scornful, and I bribed him to mention the plebiscite to no one, but secretly I was elated and amazed. I feel lost tonight without my smiles. I rose a moment ago to look for it in my mirror. I like to believe that she has it now. I think she may have some other forgotten trifles of mine with it that make the difference between that man and this. I remember her speaking of my smile, telling me it was my one adornment, and taking it from me, so to speak, for a moment to let me see how she looked in it. She delighted to make sport of me when she was in a wayward mood, and to show me all my ungainly tricks of voice and gesture, exaggerated and glorified in her entrancing self, like a star calling to the earth. See, I will show you how you hobble round, and always there was a challenge to me in her eyes to stop her if I dared, and upon them, when she was most audacious, lay a sweet mist. They all came to her court, as is the business of young fellows, to tell her what love is, and she listened with a noble frankness, having, indeed, the friendliest face for all engaged in this pursuit that can ever have sat on a woman. I have heard ladies call her coquette, not understanding that she shone softly upon all who entered the lists, because, with the rarest intuition, she foresaw that they must go away broken men, and already sympathized with their dear wounds. All wounds incurred for love were dear to her. At every true utterance about love she exulted with grave approval, or it might be with a little, ah, or oh, like one drinking deliciously. Nothing could have been more fair, for she was the first comer who could hit the target, which was her heart. She adored all beautiful things in their every curve and fragrance, so that they became part of her. Day by day she gathered beauty. Had she had no heart, she who was the bosom of womanhood, her thoughts would still have been as lilies, because the good is the beautiful. And they all forgave her. I never knew of one who did not forgive her. I think, had there been one, it would have proved that there was a flaw in her. Perhaps, when goodbye came, she was weeping because all the pretty things were said and done with, or she was making doleful confessions about herself, so impulsive and generous and confidential, and so devoid of humour, that they compelled even a tragic swain to laugh. She made a looking-glass of his face to seek woefully in it whether she was at all to blame, and when his arms went out for her and she stepped back so that they fell empty, she mourned with dear sympathy his lack of skill to seize her. For what her soft eyes said was that she was always waiting tremulously to be won, they all forgave her because there was nothing to forgive, or very little, just the little that makes a dear girl dearer. And often afterward, I believe, they have laughed fondly when thinking of her, like boys brought back. You ladies, who are everything to your husbands, save a girl from the dream of youth. Have you never known that double-chinned, industrious man laugh suddenly in a reverie, and start up, as if he fancied he were being hailed from far away. I hear her hailing me now. She was so light-hearted that her laugh is what comes first across the years, so high-spirited that she would have wept like Mary of Scots because she could not lie on the bare plains like the men. 
I hear her, but it is only an echo. I see her, but it is as a light among distant trees, and the middle-aged man can draw no nearer. She was only for the boys. There was a month when I could have shown her to you in all her bravery, but then the veil fell, and from that moment I understood her not. For long I watched her, but she was never clear to me again, and for long she hovered round me, like a dear heart willing to give me a thousand chances to regain her love. She was so picturesque that she was the last word of art, but she was as young as if she were the first woman. The world must have rung with gallant deeds and grown lovely thoughts for numberless centuries before she could be. She was the child of all the brave and wistful imaginings of men. She was as mysterious as night when it fell for the first time upon the earth. She was the thing we call romance, which lives in the little hut beyond the blue haze of the pine woods. No one could have looked less elfish. She was all on a noble scale. Her attributes were so generous, her manner unconquerably gracious, her movements indolently active, her face so candid that you must swear her every thought lived always in the open. Yet with it all, she was a wild thing, alert, suspicious of the lasso, nosing it in every man's hand, more curious about it than about aught else in the world. Her quivering delight was to see it cast for her, her game to elude it. So mettlesome was she, that she loved it to be cast fair, that she might escape as it was closing round her. She scorned, however her heart might be beating, to run from her pursuers. She took only the one step backward, which still left her near them, but always out of reach. Her head on high now, but her face as friendly, her manner as gracious as before. She is yours for the catching." That was ever the unspoken compact between her and the huntsman. It may be but an old trick come back to me with these memories, but again I clasp my hand to my brows in amaze at the thought that all this was for me could I retain her love. For I won it, wonder of the gods, but I won it. I found myself with one foot across the magic circle wherein she moved, and which none but I had entered, and so, I think, I saw her in revelation, not as the wild thing they had all conceived her, but as she really was. I saw no tameless creature, nothing wild or strange. I saw my sweet love placid as a young cow browsing. As I brushed aside the haze, and she was truly seen for the first time, she raised her head like one caught, and gazed at me with meek, affrighted eyes. I told her what had been revealed to me as I looked upon her, and she trembled, knowing she was at last found, and fain would she have fled away, but that her fear was less than her gladness. She came to me slowly, no incomprehensible thing to me now, but transparent as a pool, and so restful to look upon that she was a bath to the eyes, like banks of moss. Because I knew the maid, she was mine. Every maid, I say, is for him who can know her. The others had but followed the glamour in which she walked, but I have pierced it and found the woman. I could anticipate her every thought and gesture. I could have flashed and rippled and mocked for her, and melted for her, and been dear disdain for her. She would forget this and be suddenly conscious of it as she began to speak, when she gave me a look with a shy smile in it, which meant that she knew I was already waiting at the end of what she had to say. I call this the blush of the eye. She had a look and a voice that were for me alone. Her very fingertips were charged with caresses for me. And I loved even her naughtinesses, as when she stamped her foot at me, which she could not do without also gnashing her teeth, 
like a child trying to look fearsome. How pretty was that gnashing of her teeth! All her tormentings of me turned suddenly into sweetnesses, and who could torment like this exquisite fury, wondering in sudden flame why she could give herself to anyone, while I wondered only why she could give herself to me? It may be that I wondered over much. Perhaps that was why I lost her. It was in the full of the moon that she was most restive, but I brought her back and at first she could have bit my hand, but then she came willingly. Never, I thought, shall she be wholly tamed, but he who knows her will always be able to bring her back. I am not that man. For mystery of mysteries I lost her. I know not how it was, though in the twilight of my life that then began, I groped for reasons until I wearied of myself. All I know is, that she had ceased to love me. I had won her love, but I could not keep it. The discovery came to me slowly, as if I were a most dull-witted man. At first I knew only that I no longer understood her as of old. I found myself wondering what she had meant by this and that. I did not see that when she began to puzzle me, she was already lost to me. It was as if, unknowing, I had strayed outside the magic circle. When I did understand, I tried to cheat myself into the belief that there was no change, and the dear heart bleeding for me assisted in that poor pretense. She sought to glide to me with swimming eyes as before, but it showed only that this caressing movement was still within her compass, but never again for me. With the hands she had pressed to her breast, she touched mine, but no longer could they convey the message. The current was broken, and soon we had to desist miserably from our pretenses. She could tell no more than I why she had ceased to love me. She was scarcely less anxious than I that I should make her love me again, and, as I have said, she waited with a wonderful tolerance while I strove futilely to discover in what I was lacking, and to remedy it, and when, at last, she had to leave me, it was with compassionate cries and little backward flights. The failure was mine alone, but I think I should not have been so altered by it, had I known what was the defect in me through which I let her love escape. This puzzle has done me more harm than the loss of her, Nevertheless, you must know, if I am to speak honestly to you, that I do not repent me those dallyings in enchanted fields. It may not have been so always, for I remember a black night when a poor lieutenant lay down in an oarless boat and let it drift toward the weir. But his distant moans do not greatly pain me now. Rather, am I elated to find as the waters bring him nearer, that this boy is I. For it is something to know that, once upon a time, a woman could draw blood from me as from another. I saw her again years afterward, when she was a married woman playing with her children. She stamped her foot at a naughty one, and I saw the gleam of her teeth as she gnashed them in the dear pretty way I can't forget and then a boy and girl, fighting for her shoulders, brought the whole group joyously to the ground. She picked herself up in the old leisurely manner, lazily active, and looked around her benignantly, like a cow, our dear wild one safely tethered at last with a rope of children. I meant to make her my devoirs, but as I stepped forward, the old wound broke out afresh, and I had to turn away. They were but a few poor drops, which fell because I found that she was even a little sweeter than I had thought. End of chapter 11For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra. 
The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry. Chapter 10. Chapter 10. Sporting Reflections. I have now told you, I presume, how I became whimsical, and I fear it would please Mary not at all. But speaking of her, and as the cat's light keeps me in a ruminating mood, suppose, instead of returning Mary to her lover by means of the letter, I had presented a certain clubman to her consideration. Certainly no such whimsical idea crossed my mind when I dropped the letter, but between you and me and my night socks, which have all this time been airing by the fire because I am subject to cold feet, I have sometimes toyed with it since. Why did I not think of this in time? Was it because I must ever remain true to the unattainable she? I am reminded of a passage in the life of a sweet lady, a friend of mine, whose daughter was on the eve of marriage, when suddenly her lover died. It then became pitiful to watch that trembling old face, trying to point the way of courage to the young one. In time, however, there came another youth, as true, I dare say, as the first, but not so well known to me, and I shrugged my shoulders cynically to see my old friend once more a matchmaker. She took him to her heart and boasted of him, like one made young herself by the great event. She joyously dressed her pale daughter in her bridal gown, and, with smiles upon her face, she cast rice after the departing carriage. But soon after it had gone, I chanced upon her in her room, and she was on her knees in tears before the spirit of the dead lover. Forgive me, she besought him, for I am old and life is grey to friendless girls. The pardon she wanted was for pretending to her daughter that women should act thus. I am sure she felt herself soiled. But men are of a coarser clay, at least I am, and nearly twenty years had elapsed, and here was I, burdened under a load of affection, like a sack of returned love letters, with no lap into which to dump them. They were all written to another woman, ma'am, and yet I am in hopes that you will find something in them about yourself. It would have sounded oddly to Mary, but life is grey to friendless girls, and something might have come of it. On the other hand, it would have brought her for ever out of the wood of the little hut, and I had but to drop the letter to send them both back there. The easiness of it tempted me. Besides, she would tire of me when I was really known to her. They all do, you see. And after all, why should he lose his love because I had lost my smile? And then again... The whole thing was merely a whimsical idea. I dropped the letter and shouldered my burden. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Little White Bird This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Sandra The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry Chapter 11 Chapter 11 The Runaway Perambulator I sometimes met David in public places such as the Kensington Gardens, where he lauded it surrounded by his suite and wearing the blank face and glass eyes of all carriage people. On these occasions I always stalked by, meditating on higher things, though Mary seemed to think me very hard-hearted, and Irene, who had become his nurse, I forget how, but fear I had something to do with it, ran after me with messages, as, would I not call and see him in his home at twelve o'clock, at which moment, it seemed, he was at his best. No, I would not. He says tick-tack to the clock, Irene said, trying to snare me. Pooh, said I. Other little uns just say tick-tick, she told me, with a flush of pride. I prefer tick-tick, I said, whereat she departed in dudgeon. Had they had the sense to wheel him behind a tree and leave him, I would have looked, 
but as they lacked it I decided to wait until he could walk, when it would be more easy to waylay him. However, he was a cautious little gauble, who, after many threats to rise, always seemed to come to the conclusion that he might do worse than remain where he was, and when he had completed his first year, I lost patience with him. When I was his age, I said to Irene, I was running about. I consulted them casually about this matter at the club, and they had all been running about at a year old. I made this nurse the following offer. If she would bring the dilatory boy to my rooms and leave him there for half an hour, I would look at him. At first, Mary, to whom the offer was passed on, rejected it with hauteur, but presently she wavered, and the upshot was that Irene, looking scornful and anxious, arrived one day with the perambulator. Without casting eyes on its occupant, I pointed Irene to the door. In half an hour, I said. She begged permission to remain and promised to turn her back and so on, but I was obdurate, and she then delivered herself of a passionately affectionate farewell to her charge, which was really all directed against me and ended with these powerful words. And if he takes off your socks, my pretty, may he be blasted for evermore. I shall probably take off her socks, I said, carelessly to this. Her socks? Do you see what made Irene scream? It is a girl, is it not? I asked, thus neatly depriving her of coherent speech as I pushed her to the door. I then turned round to, to begin, and, after reflecting, I began by sitting down behind the hood of his carriage. My plan was to accustom him to his new surroundings, before bursting on the scene myself. I had various thoughts. Was he awake? If not, better let him wake naturally. Half an hour was a long time. Why had I not said quarter of an hour? Anon, I saw that if I was to sit there much longer, I should have said an hour, so I whistled softly. But he took no notice. I remember trying to persuade myself that if I never budged till Irene's return, it would be an amusing triumph over Mary. I coughed, but still there was no response. Abruptly the fear smote me. Perhaps he is not there. I rose hastily and was striding forward when I distinctly noticed a covert movement somewhere near the middle of the carriage and heard a low gurgle which was instantly suppressed. I stopped dead at this sharp reminder that I was probably not the only curious person in the room, and for a long moment we both lay low, after which, I am glad to remember, I made the first advance. Earlier in the day I had arranged some likely articles on a side table, my watch and chain, my bunch of keys, and two war medals for plodding merit, and with a glance at these, as something to fall back upon, I stepped forward doggedly, looking, I fear now, a little like a professor of leisure domain. David was sitting up, and he immediately fixed his eyes on me. It would ill become me to attempt to describe this dear boy to you, for of course I know really nothing about children. So I shall say only this, that I thought him very like what Timothy would have been had he ever had a chance. I, to whom David had been brought for judgment, now found myself being judged by him, and this rearrangement of the pieces seemed so natural that I felt no surprise. I felt only a humble craving to hear him signify that I would do. I have stood up before other keen judges, and deceived them all, but I made no effort to deceive David. I wanted to, but dared not. Those unblinking eyes were too new to the world to be hooded by any of its tricks. In them I saw my true self. They opened for me that peddler's pack of which I have made so much ado, 
and I found that it was weighted less with pretty little sad love tokens than with ignoble thoughts and deeds and an unguided life. I looked dejectedly at David, not so much, I think, because I had such a sorry display for him, as because I feared he would not have me in his service. I seemed to know that he was making up his mind once and for all. And in the end he smiled, perhaps only because I looked so frightened, but the reason scarcely mattered to me. I felt myself a fine fellow at once. It was a long smile, too, opening slowly to its fullest extent, as if to let me in, and then as slowly shutting. Then, to divert me from sad thoughts, or to rivet our friendship, or because the time had come for each of us to show the other what he could do, he immediately held one foot high in the air. This made him slide down the perambulator, and I saw at once that it was very necessary to replace him. But never before had I come into such close contact with a child. The most I had ever done was, when they were held up to me, to shut my eyes and kiss a vacuum. David, of course, though no doubt he was eternally being replaced, could tell as little as myself how it was contrived, and yet we managed it between us quite easily. His body instinctively assumed a certain position as I touched him, which compelled my arms to fall into place, and the thing was done. I felt absurdly pleased, but he was already considering what he should do next. He again held up his foot, which had a gouty appearance owing to its being contained in a dumpy little worsted sock and I thought he proposed to repeat his first performance, but in this I did him an injustice, for, unlike Porthos, he was one who scorned to do the same feat twice. Perhaps, like the conjurers, he knew that the audience were more on the alert the second time. I discovered that he wanted me to take off his sock. Remembering Irene's dread warnings on this subject, I must say that I felt uneasy. Had he heard her, and was he daring me? And what dire thing could happen if the sock was removed? I sought to reason with him, but he signed to me to look sharp, and I removed the sock. The part of him thus revealed gave David considerable pleasure, but I noticed, as a curious thing, that he seemed to have no interest in the other foot. However, it was not there merely to be looked at, for after giving me a glance which said, Now observe, he raised his bare foot and ran his mouth along the toes, like one playing on a barbaric instrument. He then tossed his foot aside, smiled his long triumphant smile, and intimated that it was now my turn to do something. I thought the best thing I could do would be to put his sock on him again, but as soon as I tried to do so, I discovered why Irene had warned me so portentously against taking it off. I should say that she had trouble in socking him every morning. Nevertheless, I managed to slip it on while he was debating what to do with my watch. I bitterly regretted that I could do nothing with it myself, put it under a wine glass, for instance, and make it turn into a rabbit, which so many people can do. In the meantime, David, occupied with similar thoughts, very nearly made it disappear altogether, and I was thankful to be able to pull it back by the chain. Ha, ha, ha! Thus he commented on his new feet, but it was also a reminder to me, a trifle cruel, that he was not my boy. After all, you see, Mary had not given him the whole of his laugh. The watch said that five and twenty minutes had passed, and looking out I saw Irene at one end of the street, staring up at my window. And at the other end, Mary's husband staring up at my window, and beneath me, Mary staring up at my window. They had all broken their promise.
I returned to David and asked him in a low voice whether he would give me a kiss. He shook his head about six times, and I was in despair. Then the smile came, and I knew that he was teasing me only. He now nodded his head about six times. This was the prettiest of all his exploits. It was so pretty that, contrary to his rule, he repeated it. I had held out my arms to him, and first he shook his head, and then, after a long pause, to frighten me, he nodded it. But no sooner was he in my arms than I seemed to see Mary and her husband and Irene bearing down upon my chambers to take him from me, and acting under an impulse, I whipped him into the perambulator and was off with it without a license down the back staircase. To the Kensington Gardens we went. It may have been Manitoba we started for, but we arrived at the Kensington Gardens. And it had all been so unpremeditated and smartly carried out that I remember clapping my hand to my head in the street to make sure that I was wearing a hat. I watched David to see what he thought of it, and he had not yet made up his mind. Strange to say, I no longer felt shy. I was grown suddenly indifferent to public comment, and my elation increased when I discovered that I was being pursued. They drew a cordon round me near Margot Meredith's tree, but I broke through it by a strategic movement to the south, and was next heard of in the baby's walk. They held both ends of this passage, and then thought to close on me, but I slipped through their fingers by doubling up Bunting's thumb into Picnic Street. Cowering at St. Govor's well, we saw them rush distractedly up the hump, and when they had crossed to the round pond, we paraded gaily in the broad walk, not feeling the tiniest bit sorry for anybody. Here, however, it gradually came into David's eyes that, after all, I was a strange man, and they opened wider and wider until they were the size of my medals, and then, with the deliberation that distinguishes his smile, he slowly prepared to howl. I saw all his forces gathering in his face, and I had nothing to oppose to them. It was an unarmed man against a regiment. Even then I did not chide him. He could not know that it was I who had dropped the letter. I think I must have stepped over a grateful fairy at that moment, for who else could have reminded me so opportunely of my famous manipulation of the eyebrows, forgotten since I was in the fifth form? I alone of boys had been able to elevate and lower my eyebrows separately, when the one was climbing my forehead, the other descended it like two buckets in the well. Most diffidently did I call this accomplishment to my aid now, and immediately David checked his forces and considered my unexpected movement without prejudice. His face remained as it was, his mouth open to emit the howl if I did not surpass expectation. I saw that, like the fair-minded boy he has always been, he was giving me my chance, and I worked feverishly, my chief fear being that, owing to his youth, he might not know how marvellous was this thing I was doing. It is an appeal to the intellect, as well as to the senses, and no one on earth can do it except myself. When I paused for a moment exhausted, he signed gravely with unchanged face that though it was undeniably funny, he had not yet decided whether it was funny enough. And taking this for encouragement, at it I went once more, till I saw his forces wavering, when I sent my left eyebrow up almost further than I could bring it back, and with that I had him. The smile broke through the clouds. In the midst of my hard-won triumph, I heard cheering. I had been vaguely conscious that we were not quite alone, but had not dared to look away from David. I looked now and found to my annoyance 
that I was the centre of a deeply interested gathering of children. There was, in particular, one vulgar little street boy. However, if that damped me in the moment of victory, I was soon to triumph gloriously in what began like defeat. I had sat me down on one of the garden seats in the figs, with one hand resting carelessly on the perambulator, in imitation of the nurses. It was so pleasant to assume the air of one who walked with David daily, when, to my chagrin, I saw Mary approaching with quick, stealthy steps, and already so near me that flight would have been ignominy. Porthos, of whom she had hold, bounded toward me, waving his traitorous tail, but she slowed on seeing that I had observed her. She had run me down with my own dog. I have not mentioned that Porthos had, for some time now, been a visitor at her house, though never can I forget the shock I got the first time I saw him, strolling out of it like an afternoon caller. Of late he has avoided it, crossing to the other side when I go that way, and rejoining me further on. So I conclude that Mary's husband is painting him. I waited her coming stiffly, in great depression of spirits, and noted that her first attentions were for David, who, somewhat shabbily, gave her the end of a smile which had been begun for me. It seemed to relieve her, for what one may call the wild maternal look left her face, and trying to check little gasps of breath, the result of unseemly running, she signed to her confederates to remain in the background and turned curious eyes on me. Had she spoken as she approached, I am sure her words would have been as flushed as her face, but now her mouth puckered, as David's does before he sets forth upon his smile, and I saw that she thought she had me in a parley at last. I could not help being a little anxious, she said craftily, but I must own, with some sweetness, I merely raised my hat, and at that she turned quickly to David. I cannot understand why the movement was so hasty, and lowered her face to his. Oh, little trump of a boy! Instead of kissing her, he seized her face with one hand, and tried to work her eyebrows up and down with the other. He failed, and his obvious disappointment in his mother was as nectar to me. I don't understand what you want, darling, said she in distress and looked at me inquiringly, and I understood what he wanted, and let her see that I understood. Had I been prepared to converse with her, I should have said elatedly that, had she known what he wanted, still she could not have done it, though she had practised for twenty years. I tried to express all this by another movement of my hat. It caught David's eye, and at once he appealed to me with the most perfect confidence. She failed to see what I did, for I shyly gave her my back, but the effect on David was miraculous. He signed to her to go, for he was engaged for the afternoon. What would you have done then, reader? I didn't. In my great moment I had strength of character to raise my hat for the third time and walk away, leaving the child to judge between us. I walked slowly, for I knew I must give him time to get it out, and I listened eagerly, but that was unnecessary, for when it did come it was a very roar of anguish. I turned my head and saw David fiercely pushing the woman aside, that he might have one last long look at me. He held out his wistful arms and nodded repeatedly, and I faltered, but my glorious scheme saved me and I walked on. It was a scheme conceived in a flash, and ever since relentlessly pursued, to burrow under Mary's influence with the boy, expose her to him in all her vagaries, take him utterly from her, and make him mine. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of the Little White Bird. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry. Chapter Twelve The Pleasantest Club in London. All perambulators lead to the Kensington Gardens. Not, however, that you will see David in his perambulator much longer, for soon after I first shook his faith in his mother, it came to him to be up and doing, and he up and did in the broad walk itself, where he would stand alone, most elaborately poised signing imperiously to the british public to time him and looking his most heavenly just before he fell he fell with a dump and as they always laughed then he pretended that this was his funny way of finishing that was on a monday on tuesday he climbed the stone stair of the gold king looking over his shoulder gloriously at each step and on wednesday he struck three and went into knickerbockers for the Kensington Gardens, you must know, are full of shortcuts, familiar to all who play there, and the shortest leads from the baby in long clothes to the little boy of three riding on the fence. It is called the Mother's Tragedy. If you're a burgess of the gardens, which have a vocabulary of their own, the faces of these quaint mothers are a clock to you, in which you may read the ages of their young. When he is three, they are said to wear the knickerbocker face, and you may take it from me that Mary assumed that face with a sigh. Fain would she have kept her boy a baby longer, but he insisted on his rights, and I encouraged him that I might notch another point against her. I was now seeing David once at least every week. His mother, who remained culpably obtuse to my sinister design, having instructed Irene that I was to be allowed to share him with her, and we had become close friends, though the little nurse was ever a threatening shadow in the background. Irene, in short, did not improve with acquaintance. I found her to be high and mighty, chiefly, I think, because she now wore a nurse's cap with streamers, of which the little creature was ludicrously proud. She assumed the airs of an official person, and always talked as if generations of babies had passed through her hands. She was also extremely jealous and had a way of signifying disapproval of my methods that led to many coldnesses and even bickerings between us, which I now see to have been undignified. I brought the following accusations against her. That she prated too much about right and wrong. That she was a martinet. That she pretended it was a real cap with real streamers, when she knew Mary had made the whole thing out of muslin blind. I regret having used this argument, but it was the only one that really damped her. On the other hand, she accused me of spoiling him, of not thinking of his future, of never asking him where he expected to go to if he did such things, of telling him tales that had no moral application, of saying that the handkerchief disappeared into nothingness when it really disappeared into a small tin cup attached to my person by a piece of elastic. To this last charge I plead guilty, for in those days I had a pathetic faith in legerdemain, and the eyebrow feat, which, however, is entirely an affair of skill, having yielded such good results, I naturally cast about for similar diversions when it ceased to attract. It lost its hold on David suddenly, as I was to discover was the fate of all of them. Twenty times would he call for my latest and exult in it. And the twenty-first time, and ever afterward, he would stare blankly as if wondering what the man meant. He was like the child queen who, when the great joke was explained to her, said coldly, We are not amused. And I assure you it is a humiliating thing to perform before an infant who intimates, after giving you ample time to make your points, that he is not amused. I hoped that when David was able to talk, and not merely to stare at me for five minutes, and then say, Hat, his spoken verdict, however damning, would be less expressive than his verdict without words. But I was disillusioned. I remember once in those later years, when he could keep up such spirited conversations with himself, that he had little need for any of us. Promising to do something exceedingly funny with a box and two marbles, and after he had watched for a long time, he said gravely, Tell me when it begins to be funny. I confess to having received a few simple lessons in conjuring in a dimly lighted chamber beneath the shop 
from a gifted young man with a long neck and a pimply face who as i entered took a barber's pole from my pocket saying at the same time come come sir this will never do whether because he knew too much or because he wore a trick shirt he was the most depressing person i have ever encountered he felt none of the artist's joy and it was sad to see one so well calculated to give pleasure to thousands not caring a dump about it the barber's pole i successfully extracted from david's mouth but the difficulty not foreseen of knowing how to dispose of a barber's pole in the kensington gardens is considerable there always being polite children hovering near who run after you and restore it to you the young man again had said that any one would lend me a bottle or a lemon but though these were articles on which he seemed ever able to lay his hand i found what i had never noticed before that there is a curious dearth of them in the gardens the magic egg cup i usually carried about with me and with its connivance i did some astonishing thing with pennies but even the penny that costs sixpence is uncertain and just when you're saying triumphantly that it will be found in the egg cup it may clatter to the ground whereupon some ungenerous spectator such as irene accuses you of fibbing and corrupting youthful minds it was useless to tell her through clenched teeth that the whole thing was a joke for she understood no jokes except her own of which she had the most immoderately high opinion and that would have mattered little to me had not david liked them also there were times when i could not but think less of the boy seeing him rock convulsed over antics of irene that have been known to every nursemaid since the year one while i stood by sneering he would give me the ecstatic look that meant irene is really very entertaining isn't she we were rivals but i desired to treat her with scrupulous fairness and i admit that she had one good thing to wit her gutta percha tooth in earlier days one of her front teeth as she told me had fallen out but instead of then parting with it the resourceful child had hammered it in again with a hairbrush which she offered to show me with the dents on it this tooth having in time passed away its place was supplied by one of gutta percha made by herself which seldom came out except when she sneezed and if it merely fell at her feet well, this was a sign that the cold was to be a slight one but if it shot across the room she knew she was in for something notable irene's tooth was very favorably known in the gardens where the perambulators used to gather round her to hear whether it had been doing anything to-day and i would not have grudged david his proprietary pride in it had he seemed to understand that irene's one poor little accomplishment though undeniably showy was without intellectual merit i have sometimes stalked away from him intimating that if his regard was to be got so cheaply i begged to retire from the competition but the gardens are the pleasantest club in london and i soon returned how i scoured the gardens looking for him and how skilful i became at picking him out far away among the trees though other mothers imitated the picturesque attire of him to mary's indignation i also cut irene's wings so to speak by taking her to a dentist and david did some adorable things for instance he used my pockets as receptacles into which he put any article he might not happen to want at that moment he shoved it in quite as if they were his own pockets without saying by your leave and perhaps i discovered it on reaching home a tin soldier or a pistol when i put it on my mantel shelf and sighed and here is another pleasant memory one day i had been over friendly to another boy and after enduring it for some time david up and struck him it was exactly as porthos does when i favor other dogs he knocks them down with his foot and stands over them looking very noble and stern so i knew its meaning at once it was david's first public intimation that he knew i belonged to him irene scolded him for striking that boy and made him stand in disgrace at the corner of a seat in the broad walk the seat at the corner of which david stood suffering for love of me is the one nearest to the round pond to persons coming from the north you may be sure that she and i had words over this fiendish cruelty when next we met i treated her as one who no longer existed 
and at first she bridled and then was depressed and as i was going away she burst into tears she cried because neither at meeting nor parting had i lifted my hat to her a foolish custom of mine of which as i now learned to my surprise she was very proud she and i still have our tiffs but i have never since then forgotten to lift my hat to irene i also made a promise to bow to me at which she affected to scoff saying i was taking my fun of her but she was really pleased and i tell you irene has one of the prettiest and most touching little bows imaginable it is half to the side if i may so express myself which has always been my favorite bow and i doubt not she acquired it by watching mary i should be sorry to have it thought as you may now be thinking that i look on children as on puppy dogs who care only for play perhaps that was my idea when first i tried to lure david to my unaccustomed arms and even for some time after for if i am to be candid i must own that until he was three years old i sought merely to amuse him god forgive me but i had only one day a week in which to capture him and i was very raw at the business i was about to say that david opened my eyes to the folly of it but really i think this was irene's doing watching her with children i learned that partial as they are to fun they are moved almost more profoundly by moral excellence so fond of babes was this little mother that she had always room near her for one more and often have i seen her in the gardens the centre of a dozen mites who gazed awestruck at her while she told them severely how little ladies and gentlemen behave they were children of the well to pass and she was from drury lane but they believed in her as the greatest of all authorities on little ladies and gentlemen and the more they heard of how these romantic creatures keep themselves tidy and avoid pools and wait till they come to a gate the more they admired them though their faces showed how profoundly they felt that to be little ladies and gentlemen was not for them you can't think what hopeless little faces they were children are not at all like puppies i have said but do puppies care only for play that wistful look which the merriest of them sometimes wear i wonder whether it means that they would like to hear about the good puppies as you shall see i invented many stories for david practicing the telling of them by my fireside as if they were conjuring feats while irene knew only one but she told it as never has any other fairy tale been told in my hearing it was the prettiest of them all and was recited by the heroine why were the king and queen not at home david would ask her breathlessly i suppose said irene thinking it out they was away buying the victuals she always told the story gazing into vacancy so that david thought it was really happening somewhere up the broad walk and when she came to its greatest moments her little bosom heaved never shall i forget the concentrated scorn with which the prince said to the sisters neither of you ain't the one what wore the glass slipper and then and then and then said irene not artistically to increase the suspense but because it was all so glorious to her tell me tell me quick cried david though he knew the tale by heart she sits down like said irene trembling in second sight and she tries on the glass slipper and it fits her to a t and then the prince he cries in a ringing voice this here's my true love cinderella what now i makes my lawful wedded wife and then she would come out of her dream and look round at the grandees of the gardens with an extraordinary elation her as was only a kitchen drudge she would say in a strange soft voice and with shining eyes but was true and faithful in word and deed such was her reward i am sure that had the fairy godmother appeared just then and touched irene with her wand david would have been interested rather than astonished as for myself i believe i have surprised this little girl's secret she knows there are no fairy godmothers nowadays but she hopes that if she is always true and faithful she may some day turn into a lady in word and deed like the mistress whom she adores it is a dead secret a drury lane child's romance 
but what an amount of heavy artillery will be brought to bear against it in this sad london of ours not much chance for her i suppose good luck to you irene end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of the Little White Bird. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry. Chapter Thirteen The Grand Tour of the Gardens. You must see for yourselves that it will be difficult to follow our adventures unless you are familiar with the Kensington Gardens, as they now became known to David. They are in London, where the King lives, and you go to them every day, unless you are looking decidedly flushed. But no one has ever been in the whole of the gardens, because it is soon time to turn back. The reason it is soon time to turn back is that you sleep from twelve to one. If your mother was not so sure that you sleep from twelve to one, you could most likely see the whole of them. The gardens are bounded on one side by a never-ending line of omnibuses, over which Irene has such authority that as she holds up her finger to any of them, it stops immediately. She then crosses with you in safety to the other side. There are more gates to the gardens than one gate, but that is the one you go in at and before you go in you speak to the lady with the balloons who sits just outside this is as near to being inside as she may venture because if she were to let go of her hold of the railings for one moment the balloons would lift her up and she would be flown away she sits very squat for the balloons are always tugging at her and the strain has given her quite a red face once she was a new one because the old one had let go and David was very sorry for the old one, but as she did let go, he wished he had been there to see. The gardens are a tremendous big place with millions and hundreds of trees, and first you come to the figs, but you scorn to loiter there, for the figs is the resort of superior little persons who are forbidden to mix with the commonality, and it is so named according to legend because they dress in full fig. These dainty ones are themselves contemptuously called figs by David and other heroes, and you have a key to the manners and customs of the dandiacal section of the gardens when I tell you that cricket is called crickets here. Occasionally a rebel fig climbs over the fence into the world, and such a one was Miss Mabel Gray, of whom I shall tell you when we come to Miss Mabel Gray's gate. She was the only really celebrated fig. We are now in the broad walk, and it is as much bigger than the other walks as your father is bigger than you. David wondered if it began little and grew and grew till it was quite grown up, and whether the other walks are its babies. And he drew a picture which diverted him very much of the broad walk, giving a tiny walk an airing in a perambulator. In the broad walk, you meet all the people who are worth knowing and there is usually a grown-up with them to prevent their going on the damp grass, and to make them stand disgraced at the corner of a seat if they have been Mad Dog or Mary Annish. To be Mary Annish is to behave like a girl, whimpering because nurse won't carry you, or simpering with your thumb in your mouth, and it is a hateful quality, but to be Mad Dog is to kick out at everything and there is some satisfaction in that. If I were to point out all the notable places as we pass up the broad walk, it would be time to turn back before we reach them. And I simply wave my stick at Seco's tree, that memorable spot where a boy called Seco lost his penny, and looking for it, found two pence. There has been a good deal of excavation going on there ever since. Farther up the walk is the little wooden house in which Marmaduke Perry hid. Now there is no more awful story of the gardens by day than this of Marmaduke Perry, who had been Mary Annish three days in succession, and was sentenced to appear in the broad walk dressed in his sister's clothes. He hid in the little wooden house, and refused to emerge until they brought him knickerbockers with pockets. 
You now try to go to the round pond, but nurses hate it because they are not really manly and they make you look the other way at the big penny and the baby's palace she was the most celebrated baby of the gardens and lived in the palace all alone with ever so many dolls so people rang the bell and up she got out of her bed though it was past six o'clock and she lighted a candle and opened the door in her nighty and then they all cried with great rejoicings hail queen of england what puzzled David most was how she knew where the matches were kept. The big penny is a statue about her. Next we come to the hump, which is the part of the broad walk where all the big races are run, and even though you had no intention of running, you do run when you come to the hump. It is such a fascinating slide-down kind of place. Often you stop when you have run about halfway down it, and then you are lost. But there is another little wooden house near here called the lost house and so you tell the man that you are lost and then he finds you it is glorious fun racing down the hump but you can't do it on windy days because then you are not there but the fallen leaves do it instead of you there is almost nothing that has such a keen sense of fun as a fallen leaf from the hump we can see the gate that is called after miss mabel gray the fig i promised to tell you about there were always two nurses with her, or else one mother and one nurse, and for a long time she was a pattern child who always coughed off the table and said, How do you do? to the other figs, and the only game she played at was flinging a ball gracefully and letting the nurse bring it back to her. Then one day she tired of it all and went mad dog, and first to show that she really was mad dog, she unloosened both her boot laces and put out her tongue east, west, north, and south. She then flung her sash into a puddle and danced on it till dirty water was squirted over her frock, after which she climbed the fence and had a series of incredible adventures, one of the least of which was that she kicked off both her boots. At last she came to the gate that is now called after her, out of which she ran into streets David and I have never been in, though we've heard them roaring, and still she ran on, and would never again have been heard of had not her mother jumped into a bus and thus overtaken her. It all happened, I should say, long ago, and this is not the Mabel Gray whom David knows. Returning up the broad walk, we have on our right the baby walk, which is so full of perambulators that you could cross from side to side stepping on babies but the nurses won't let you do it from this walk a passage called bunting's thumb because it is that length leads into picnic street where there are real kettles and chestnut blossoms falls into your mug as you are drinking quite common children picnic here also and the blossom falls into their mugs just the same next comes st gover's well which was full of water when Malcolm the Bold fell into it. He was his mother's favorite, and he let her put her arm around his neck in public because she was a widow. But he was also partial to adventures and liked to play with a chimney sweep who had killed a good many bears. The sweep's name was Sooty, and one day when they were playing near the well, Malcolm fell in and would have drowned had not Sooty dived in and rescued him, and the water had washed Sooty clean, and he now stood revealed as Malcolm's long-lost father. So Malcolm would not let his mother put her arm round his neck any more. Between the well and the round pond are the cricket pitches, and frequently the choosing of sides exhausts so much time that there is scarcely any cricket. Everybody wants to bat first, and as soon as he is out, he bowls, unless you're the better wrestler, and while you're wrestling with him, the fielders have scattered to play at something else. The gardens are noted for two kinds of cricket. Boy cricket, which is real cricket with a bat, and girl cricket, which is with a racket and the governess. Girls can't really play cricket, and when you're watching their futile efforts you make funny sounds at them. Nevertheless, there was a very disagreeable incident one day when some forward girls challenged David's team, and a disturbing creature called Angela Clare sent down so many Yorkers that— However, 
Instead of telling you the result of that regrettable match, I shall pass on hurriedly to the round pond, which is the wheel that keeps all the gardens going. It is round because it is in the very middle of the gardens, and when you're come to it, you never want to go any farther. You can't be good all the time at the round pond, however much you try. You can be good in the broad walk all the time, but not at the round pond, and the reason is that you forget. And when you remember, you're so wet that you may as well be wetter. There are men who sail boats on the round pond, such big boats that they bring them in barrows, and sometimes in perambulators, and then the baby has to walk. The bow-legged children in the gardens are these who had to walk too soon because their father needed the perambulator. You always want to have a yacht to sail on the round pond, and in the end your uncle gives you one, and to carry it to the pond the first day is splendid. Also to talk about it to boys who have no uncle is splendid, but soon you like to leave it at home. For the sweetest craft that slips her moorings in the round pond is what is called a stick boat, because she is rather like a stick until she's in the water and you are holding the string. And then as you walk round pulling her, you see little men running about her deck, and sails rise magically and catch the breeze, and you put in on dirty nights at snug harbors which are unknown to the lordly yachts. Night passes in a twink. And again your rakish craft noses for the wind. Whale spout. You glide over buried cities and have brushes with pirates and cast anchor on coral isles. You are a solitary boy while all this is taking place. For two boys together cannot adventure far upon the round pond. And though you may talk to yourself throughout the voyage, giving orders and executing them with dispatch, you know not when it is time to go home, where you have been, or what swelled your sails, your treasure trove is all locked away in your hold, so to speak, which will be opened, perhaps, by another little boy many years afterward. But those yachts have nothing in their hold. Does anyone return to this haunt of his youth because of the yachts that used to sail it? Oh, no, it is the stick-boat that is freighted with memories. The yachts are toys. Their owner, a fresh-water mariner, they can cross and recross a pond only when the stick-boat goes to sea. You yachtsmen with your wands, who think we are all there to gaze upon you, your ships are only accidents of this place, and were they all to be boarded and sunk by the ducks, the real business of the round pond would be carried on as usual. Paths from everywhere crowd like children to the pond. Some of them are ordinary paths, which have a rail on each side, and are made by men with their coats off. But others are vagrants, wide at one spot, and at another so narrow that you can stand astride them, and they are called paths that have made themselves. And David did wish he could see them doing it. But like all the most wonderful things that happen in the gardens, it is done, we concluded, at night, after the gates are closed. We have also decided that the paths make themselves, because it is their only chance of getting to the round pond. One of these gypsy paths comes from the place where the sheep get their hair cut. When David shed his curls at the hairdresser's, I am told, he said good-bye to them without a tremor, though Mary has never been quite the same bright creature since, so he despises the sheep as they run from their shearer, and calls out tauntingly, cowardly cowardly custard but when the man grips them between his legs david shakes a fist at him for using such big scissors another startling moment is when the man turns back the grimy wool from the sheep's shoulders and they look suddenly like ladies in the stalls of a theatre the sheep are so frightened by the shearing that it makes them quite white and thin and as soon as they're set free they begin to nibble the grass at once quite anxiously as if they feared that they would never be worth eating. David wonders whether they know each other now that they are so different, and if it makes them fight with the wrong ones. They are great fighters, and thus so unlike country sheep that every year they give Porthos a shock. He can make a field of country sheep fly by merely announcing his approach, but these town sheep come toward him with no promise of gentle entertainment. And then a light from last year breaks upon Porthos. 
he cannot with dignity retreat but he stops and looks about him as if lost in admiration of the scenery and presently he strolls away with a fine indifference and a glint at me from the corner of his eye the serpentine begins near here it is a lovely lake and there is a drowned forest at the bottom of it if you peer over the edge you can see the trees all growing upside down and they say that at night there are also drowned stars in it if so peter pan sees them when he's sailing across the lake in the thrush's nest a small part only of the serpentine is in the gardens for soon it passes beneath a bridge too far away where the island is on which all the birds are born that become baby boys and girls no one who is human except peter pan and he is only half human can land on the island but you may write what you want boy or girl dark or fair on a piece of paper and then twist it into the shape of a boat and slip it into the water and it reaches peter pan's island after dark we are on the way home now though of course it is all pretense that we can go to so many of the places in one day i should have had to be carrying david long ago and resting on every seat like old mr salford that was what we called him because he always talked to us of a lovely place called Salford where he had been born He was a crab apple of an old gentleman who wandered all day in the gardens from seat to seat Trying to fall in with somebody who was acquainted with the town of Salford and when we had known him for a year or more We actually did meet another aged solitary who had once spent Saturday to Monday in Salford He was meek and timid and carried his address inside his hat and whatever part of london he was in search of he always went to the general post office first as a starting point him we carried in triumph to our other friend with the story of that saturday to monday and never shall i forget the gloating joy with which mr salford leaped at him they have been cronies ever since and i noticed that mr salford who naturally does most of the talking keeps tight grip of the other old man's coat the last two places before you come to our gate are the dog cemetery and the chaffinch's nest But we pretend not to know what the dog cemetery is as porthos is always with us The nest is very sad. It is quite white and the way we found it was wonderful We were having another look among the bushes for David's lost worsted ball and instead of the ball we found a lovely nest made of the worsted and containing four eggs with scratches on them very much like david's handwriting so we think they must have been the mother's love letters to the little ones inside every day we were in the gardens we paid a call at the nest taking care that no cruel boy should see us and we dropped crumbs and soon the bird knew us as friends and sat in the nest looking at us kindly with her shoulders hunched up but one day when we went there were only two eggs in the nest and the next time there were none The saddest part of it was that the poor little chaffinch fluttered about the bushes looking so reproachfully at us That we knew she thought we had done it and though David tried to explain it to her It was so long since he had spoken the bird language that I fear she did not understand He and I left the garden that day with our knuckles in our eyes End of chapter 13chapter 14 of the little white bird this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the little white bird by j m barry chapter 14 peter pan if you ask your mother whether she knew about peter pan when she was a little girl she will say why of course I did child and if you ask her whether he rode on a goat in those days She will say what a foolish question to ask certainly he did Then if you ask your grandmother whether she knew about Peter Pan when she was a girl She also says why of course I did child But if you ask her whether he rode on a goat in those days She says she never heard of his having a goat Perhaps she has forgotten just as she sometimes forgets your name and calls you Mildred 
which is your mother's name. Still, she could hardly forget such an important thing as the goat. Therefore, there was no goat when your grandmother was a little girl. This shows that in telling the story of Peter Pan to begin with a goat, as most people do, is as silly as to put on your jacket before your vest. Of course, it also shows that Peter is ever so old, but he is really always the same age, so that does not matter in the least. His age is one week, and though he was born so long ago, he has never had a birthday, nor is there the slightest chance of his ever having one. The reason is that he escaped from being a human when he was seven days old. He escaped by the window and flew back to the Kensington Gardens. If you think he was the only baby who ever wanted to escape, it shows how completely you have forgotten your own young days. When David heard this story first, he was quite certain that he never tried to escape. But I told him to think back hard, pressing his hands to his temples. And when he had done this hard, and even harder, he distinctly remembered a youthful desire to return to the treetops. And with that memory came others, as that he had lain in bed planning to escape as soon as his mother was asleep, and how she had once caught him halfway up the chimney. All children could have such recollections if they would press their hands hard to their temples, for having been birds before they were human, they are naturally a little wild during the first few weeks, and very itchy at the shoulders where their wings used to be. So David tells me. I ought to mention here that the following is our way with a story. First, I tell it to him, and then he tells it to me, the understanding being that it is quite a different story, and then I retell it with his additions, and so we go on until no one could say whether it is more his story or mine. In this story of Peter Pan, for instance, the bald narrative and most of the moral reflections are mine though not all, for this boy can be a stern moralist. But the interesting bits about the ways and customs of babies in the bird stage are mostly reminiscences of David's, recalled by pressing his hands to his temples and thinking hard. Well, Peter Pan got out by the window, which had no bars. Standing on the ledge, he could see trees far away, which were doubtless the Kensington Gardens and the moment he saw them he entirely forgot that he was now a little boy in a nightgown, and away he flew, right over the houses to the gardens. It is wonderful that he could fly without wings, but the place itched tremendously, and perhaps we could all fly if we were as dead confident sure of our capacity to do it, as was bold Peter Pan that evening. He alighted gaily on the open sward between the baby's palace and the serpentine, and the first thing he did was to lie on his back and kick. He was quite unaware already that he had ever been human, and thought he was a bird, even in appearance, just the same as in his early days. And when he tried to catch a fly, he did not understand that the reason he missed it was because he had attempted to seize it with his hand, which of course a bird never does. He saw, however, that it must be past lockout time, for there were a good many fairies about all too busy to notice him. They were getting breakfast ready, milking their cows, drawing water, and so on, and the sight of the water-pails made him thirsty, so he flew over to the round pond to have a drink. He stooped and dipped his beak in the pond. He thought it was his beak, but of course it was only his nose, and therefore very little water came up, and that not so refreshing as usual. So next he tried a puddle, and he fell flop into it, when a real bird falls in flop, he spreads out his feathers and pecks them dry. But Peter could not remember what the thing was to do, and he decided rather sulkily to go to sleep on the weeping beach in the baby walk. At first he found some difficulty in balancing himself on a branch, but presently he remembered the way and fell asleep. He awoke long before morning, shivering and saying to himself, I never was out in such a cold night. He had really been out in colder nights when he was a bird, but of course, as everybody knows, what seems a warm night to a bird is a cold night to a boy in a nightgown. Peter also felt strangely uncomfortable, as if his head was stuffy, and he heard loud noises that made him look round sharply, though they were really himself sneezing. 
there was something he wanted very much but though he knew he wanted it he could not think what it was what he wanted so much was his mother to blow his nose but that never struck him so he decided to appeal to the fairies for enlightenment they are reputed to know a good deal there were two of them strolling along the baby walk with their arms round each other's waists and he hopped down to address them the fairies have their tiffs with the birds but they usually give a civil answer to a civil question and he was quite angry when these two ran away the moment they saw him another was lolling on a garden chair reading a postage stamp which some human had let fall and when he heard peter's voice he popped in alarm behind a tulip to peter's bewilderment he discovered that every fairy he met fled from him a band of workmen who were sawing down a toadstool rushed away leaving their tools behind them a milkmaid turned her pail upside down and hid in it and soon the gardens were in an uproar crowds of fairies were running this away and that asking each other stoutly who was afraid lights were extinguished doors barricaded and from the grounds of queen mab's palace came the rub-a-dub of drums showing that the royal guard had been called out a regiment of lancers came charging down the broad walk armed with holly leaves with which they jogged the enemy horribly in passing peter heard the little people crying everywhere that there was a human in the gardens after lockout time but he never thought for a moment that he was the human he was feeling stuffier and stuffier and more and more wistful to learn what he wanted done to his nose but he pursued them with a vital question in vain the timid creatures ran from him and even the lancers when he approached them up the hump turned swiftly into a sidewalk on the pretense that they saw him there despairing of the fairies he resolved to consult the birds but now he remembered as an odd thing that all the birds on the weeping beach had flown away when he alighted on it and though that had not troubled him at the time he saw its meaning now every living thing was shunning him poor little peter pan he sat down and cried and even then he did not know that for a bird he was sitting on his wrong part it is a blessing that he did not know for otherwise he would have lost faith in his power to fly and the moment you doubt whether you can fly you cease forever to be able to do it the reason birds can fly and we can't is simply that they have perfect faith for to have faith is to have wings now except by flying no one can reach the island in the serpentine for the boats of humans are forbidden to land there and there are stakes round it standing up in the water on each of which a bird sentinel sits by day and night it was to the island that Peter Pan now flew to put his strange case before old Solomon Caw, and he alighted on it with relief, much heartened to find himself at last at home, as the birds call the island. All of them were asleep, including the sentinels, except Solomon, who was wide awake on one side, and he listened quietly to Peter's adventures, and then told him their true meaning. Look at your nightgown, if you don't believe me, Solomon said, and with staring eyes Peter looked at his nightgown, and then at the sleeping birds. Not one of them wore anything. How many of your toes are thumbs, said Solomon a little cruelly, and Peter saw to his consternation that all his toes were fingers. The shock was so great that it drove away his cold. Ruffle your feathers, said the grim old Solomon and peter tried most desperately hard to ruffle his feathers but he had none and then he rose up quaking and for the first time since he stood on the window ledge he remembered a lady who had been very fond of him i think i shall go back to mother he said timidly good-bye replied solomon call with a queer look but peter hesitated why don't you go the old one asked politely i suppose said peter huskily I suppose I can still fly you see he had lost faith poor little half and half said Solomon who was not really hard-hearted you will never be able to fly again not even on windy days you must live here on the island always and never even go to the Kensington Gardens Peter asked tragically how could you get across said Solomon he promised very kindly however to teach peter as many of the bird ways as could be learned by one of such an awkward shape 
Then I shan't be exactly a human? Peter asked. No. Nor exactly a bird? No. What shall I be? You will be a betwixt and between, Solomon said. And certainly he was a wise old fellow, for that is exactly how it turned out. The birds on the island never got used to him. His oddities tickled them every day, as if they were quite new, though it was really the birds that were new. They came out of the eggs daily and laughed at him at once. Then off they soon flew to be humans, and other birds came out of other eggs, and so it went on forever. The crafty mother birds, when they tired of sitting on their eggs, used to get the young ones to break their shells a day before the right time by whispering to them that now was their chance to see Peter washing or drinking or eating. Thousands gathered round him daily to watch him do these things, just as you watch the peacocks, and they screamed with delight when he lifted the crusts they flung him with his hands instead of in the usual way with the mouth. All his food was brought to him from the garden at Solomon's orders by the birds. He would not eat worms or insects, which they thought very silly of him, and so they brought him bread in their beaks. And thus when you cry out, Greedy, greedy, to the bird that flies away with the big crust, you now know that you ought not to do this, for he is very likely taking it to Peter Pan. Peter wore no nightgown now. You see, the birds were always begging him for bits of it to line their nests with, and being very good-natured he could not refuse, and so by Solomon's advice he had hidden what was left of it. But though now he was quite naked, you must not think that he was cold or unhappy. He was usually very happy and gay, and the reason was that Solomon had kept his promise and taught him many of the bird ways. To be easily pleased, for instance and always to be really doing something, and to think that whatever he was doing was a thing of vast importance. Peter became very clever at helping the birds to build their nests. Soon he could build better than a wood pigeon, and nearly as well as a blackbird, though never did he satisfy the finches, and he made nice little water troughs near the nests, and dug up worms for the young ones with his fingers. He also became very learned in bird lore and knew an east wind from a west wind by its smell. And he could see the grass growing, and hear the insects walking about inside the tree trunks. But the best thing Solomon had done was to teach him to have a glad heart. All birds have glad hearts, unless you rob their nests. And so, as they were the only kind of heart Solomon knew about, it was easy to him to teach Peter how to have one. Peter's heart was so glad that he felt he must sing all day long, just as the birds sing for joy. But being partly human, he needed an instrument, and so he made a pipe of reeds, and he used to sit by the shore of the island of an evening, practicing the sough of the wind and the ripple of the water, and catching handfuls of the shine of the moon. And he put them all in his pipe, and played them so beautifully that even the birds were deceived, and they would say to each other, Was that a fish leaping in the water, or was it Peter playing leaping fish on his pipe? And sometimes he played the birth of birds, and then the mothers would turn round in their nests to see whether they had laid an egg. If you were a child of the gardens, you must know the chestnut tree near the bridge, which comes out in flower first of all the chestnuts. But perhaps you have not heard why this tree leads the way. It is because Peter wearies for summer and plays that it has come, and the chestnut being so near hears him and is cheated. But as Peter sat by the shore tootling divinely on his pipe, he sometimes fell into sad thoughts, and then the music became sad also, and the reason of all this sadness was that he could not reach the gardens, though he could see them through the arch of the bridge. He knew he could never be a real human again, and scarcely wanted to be one. But oh, how he longed to play as other children play, and of course there is no such lovely place to play as in the gardens. The birds brought him news of how boys and girls play, and wistful tears started in Peter's eyes. Perhaps you wonder why he did not swim across. The reason was that he could not swim. He wanted to know how to swim, but no one on the island knew the way except the ducks, and they are so stupid. They were quite willing to teach him, but all they could say was, 
you sit down on top of the water in this way and then you kick out like that peter tried it often but always before he could kick out he sank what he really needed to know was how you sit on the water without sinking and they said it was quite impossible to explain such an easy thing as that occasionally swans touched on the island and he would give them all his day's food and then ask them how they sat on the water but as soon as he had no more to give them the hateful things hissed at him and then sailed away once he really thought he had discovered a way of reaching the gardens a wonderfully white thing like a runaway newspaper floated high over the island and then tumbled rolling over and over after the manner of a bird that has broken its wing peter was so frightened that he hid but the birds told him it was only a kite and what a kite is and that it must have tugged its string out of a boy's hand and soared away after that they laughed at peter for being so fond of the kite he loved it so much that he even slept with one hand on it and i think this was pathetic and pretty for the reason he loved it was because it had belonged to a real boy to the birds this was a very poor reason but the older ones felt grateful to him at this time because he had nursed a number of fledglings through the german measles and they offered to show him how birds fly a kite so six of them took the end of the string in their beaks and flew away with it and to his amazement it flew after them and went even higher than they peter screamed out do it again and with great good nature they did it several times and always instead of thanking them he cried do it again which shows that even now he had not quite forgotten what it was to be a boy at last with a grand design burning within his brave heart he begged them to do it once more with him clinging to the tail and now a hundred flew off with the string and peter clung to the tail meaning to drop off when he was over the gardens but the kite broke to pieces in the air and he would have drowned in the serpentine had he not caught hold of two indignant swans and made them carry him to the island after this the birds said that they would help him no more in his mad enterprise nevertheless peter did reach the gardens at last by the help of shelley's boat as i am now to tell you end of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of The Little White Bird. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosehip. The Little White Bird by J. M. Barry. Chapter Fifteen The Thrush's Nest. Shelley was a young gentleman and as grown up as he need ever expect to be. He was a poet, and they are never exactly grown up. They are people who despise money except what you need for today, and he had all that and five pounds over. So, when he was walking in the Kensington Gardens, he made a paper boat of his banknote and sent it sailing on the serpentine. It reached the island at night, and the lookout brought it to Solomon Cor, who thought at first that it was the usual thing, a message from a lady, saying she would be obliged if he could let her have a good one. They always ask for the best one he has, and if he likes the letter, he sends one from Class A, but if it ruffles him, he sends very funny ones indeed. Sometimes he sends none at all, and at another time he sends a nestful. It all depends on the mood you catch him in. He likes you to leave it all to him, and if you mention particularly that you hope he will see his way to making it a boy this time, he is almost sure to send another girl. And whether you are a lady, or only a little boy who wants a baby sister, always take pains to write your address clearly. You can't think what a lot of babies Solomon has sent to the wrong house. Shelley's boat, when opened, completely puzzled Solomon, 
and he took counsel of his assistants, who, having walked over it twice, first with their toes pointed out, and then with their toes pointed in, decided that it came from some greedy person who wanted five. They thought this because there was a large five printed on it. Preposterous! cried Solomon in a rage, and he presented it to Peter. Anything useless which drifted upon the island was usually given to Peter as a plaything. But he did not play with his precious banknote, for he knew what it was at once, having been very observant during the week when he was an ordinary boy. With so much money, he reflected, he could surely at last contrive to reach the gardens, and he considered all the possible ways, and decided wisely, I think, to choose the best way. But, first, he had to tell the birds of the value of Shelley's boat, and though they were too honest to demand it back, he saw that they were galled, and they cast such black looks at Solomon, who was rather vain of his cleverness, that he flew away to the end of the island, and sat there very depressed, with his head buried in his wings. Now Peter knew that unless Solomon was on your side, you never got anything done for you in the island, so he followed him and tried to hearten him. Nor was this all that Peter did to gain the powerful old fellow's good will. You must know that Solomon had no intention of remaining in office all his life, he looked forward to retiring, by and by, and devoting his green old age to a life of pleasure on a certain yew stump in the figs, which had taken his fancy, and for years he had been quietly filling his stocking. It was a stocking belonging to some bathing person which had been cast upon the island, and at the time I speak of it contained a hundred and eighty crumbs, thirty-four nuts, sixteen crusts, a pen-wiper, and a boot-lace. When his stocking was full, Solomon calculated that he would be able to retire on a competency. Peter now gave him a pound. He cut it off his banknote with a sharp stick. This made Solomon his friend for ever and after the two had consulted together, they called a meeting of the thrushes. You will see presently why thrushes only were invited. The scheme to be put before them was really Peter's, but Solomon did most of the talking, because he soon became irritable if other people talked. He began by saying that he had been much impressed by the superior ingenuity shown by the thrushes in nest building, and this put them into good humour at once, as it was meant to do, for all the quarrels between birds are about the best way of building nests. Other birds, said Solomon, omitted to line their nests with mud, and as a result they did not hold water. Here he cocked his head, as if he had used an unanswerable argument. But, unfortunately, a Mrs. Finch had come to the meeting uninvited, and she squeaked out, We don't build nests to hold water, but to hold eggs. And then the thrushes stopped cheering, and Solomon was so perplexed that he took several sips of water. Consider, he said at last, how warm the mud makes the nest. Consider! cried Mrs. Finch, that when water gets into the nest it remains there, and your little ones are drowned. The thrushes begged Solomon with a look to say something crushing in reply to this, but again he was perplexed. Try another drink, suggested Mrs. Finch pertly. Kate was her name, and all Kates are saucy. Solomon did try another drink, and it inspired him. If, said he, 
a finch's nest is placed on the serpentine, it fills and breaks to pieces, but a thrush's nest is still as dry as the cup of a swan's back. How the thrushes applauded! Now they knew why they lined their nests with mud, and when Mrs. Finch called out, We don't place our nests on the serpentine! They did what they should have done at first, chased her from the meeting. After this it was most orderly. What they had been brought together to hear, said Solomon, was this. Their young friend, Peter Pan, as they well knew, wanted very much to be able to cross to the gardens, and he now proposed, with their help, to build a boat. At this the thrushes began to fidget, which made Peter tremble for his scheme. Solomon explained hastily that what he meant was not one of the cumbrous boats that humans use. The proposed boat was to be simply a thrush's nest, large enough to hold Peter. But still, to Peter's agony, the thrushes were sulky. We are very busy people, they grumbled and this would be a big job. Quite so, said Solomon, and of course Peter would not allow you to work for nothing. You must remember that he is now in comfortable circumstances, and he will pay you such wages as you have never been paid before. Peter Pan authorizes me to say that you shall all be paid sixpence a day. Then all the thrushes hopped for joy, and that very day was begun the celebrated building of the boat. All their ordinary business fell into arrears. It was the time of year when they should have been pairing, but not a thrush's nest was built except this big one, and so Solomon soon ran short of thrushes with which to supply the demand from the mainland. The stout, rather greedy children, who look so well in perambulators, but get puffed easily when they walk, were all young thrushes once, and ladies often ask specially for them. What do you think Solomon did? He sent over to the housetops for a lot of sparrows, and ordered them to lay their eggs in old thrushes' nests and sent their young to the ladies, and swore they were all thrushes. It was known afterward on the island as the sparrow's year, and so, when you meet, as you doubtless sometimes do, grown-up people who puff and blow as if they thought themselves bigger than they are, very likely they belong to that year. You ask them. Peter was a just master, and paid his workpeople every evening. They stood in rows on the branches, waiting politely while he cut the paper sixpences out of his banknote, and presently he called the roll, and then each bird, as the names were mentioned, flew down and got sixpence. It must have been a fine sight. And at last, after months of labour, the boat was finished. Oh, the deportment of Peter as he saw it growing more and more like a great thrush's nest. From the very beginning of the building of it, he slept by its side, and often woke up to say sweet things to it, and after it was lined with mud, and the mud had dried, he always slept in it. He sleeps in his nest still and has a fascinating way of curling round in it, for it is just large enough to hold him comfortably when he curls round like a kitten. It is brown inside, of course, but outside it is mostly green, being woven of grass and twigs, and when these wither or snap, the walls are thatched afresh. There are also a few feathers here and there, which came off the thrushes while they were building. The other birds were extremely jealous, and said that the boat would not balance on the water, but it lay most beautifully steady. They said the water would come into it, but no water came into it. 
Next, they said that Peter had no oars, and this caused the thrushes to look at each other in dismay. But Peter replied that he had no need of oars, for he had a sail, and with such a proud, happy face he produced a sail which he had fashioned out of his nightgown. And though it was still rather like a nightgown, it made a lovely sail. And that night, the moon being full, and all the birds asleep, he did enter his coracle, as Master Francis Pretty would have said, and depart out of the island. And first, he knew not why, he looked upward, with his hands clasped, and from that moment his eyes were pinned to the west. He had promised the thrushes to begin by making short voyages with them to his guides, but far away he saw the Kensington Gardens beckoning to him beneath the bridge, and he could not wait. His face was flushed, but he never looked back. There was an exultation in his little breast that drove out fear. Was Peter the least gallant of the English mariners who have sailed westward to meet the unknown? At first his boat turned round and round, and he was driven back to the place of his starting, whereupon he shortened sail by removing one of the sleeves, and was forthwith carried backward by a contrary breeze to his no small peril. He now let go the sail, with the result that he was drifted toward the far shore, where are black shadows he knew not the dangers of, but suspected them, and so once more hoisted his nightgown, and went rumour of the shadows, until he caught a favouring wind, which bore him westward, but at so great a speed that he was like to be broke against the bridge, which, having avoided, he passed under the bridge, and came to his great rejoicing within full sight of the delectable gardens. But having tried to cast anchor, which was a stone at the end of a piece of the kite-string, he found no bottom, and was fain to hold off, seeking for moorage, and, feeling his way, he buffeted against a sunken reef that cast him overboard by the greatness of the shock and he was near to being drowned, but clambered back into the vessel. There now arose a mighty storm, accompanied by roaring of waters, such as he had never heard the like, and he was tossed this way and that, and his hands so numbed with the cold that he could not close them. Having escaped the danger of which, he was mercifully carried into a small bay, where his boat rode at peace. Nevertheless, he was not yet in safety, for, on pretending to disembark, he found a multitude of small people drawn up on the shore to contest his landing, and shouting shrilly to him to be off, for it was long past lockout time. This, with much brandishing of their holly leaves, and also a company of them, carried an arrow which some boy had left in the gardens, and this they were prepared to use as a battering-ram. Then Peter, who knew them for the fairies, called out that he was not an ordinary human, and had no desire to do them displeasure, but to be their friend. Nevertheless, having found a jolly harbour, he was in no temper to draw off therefrom, and he warned them, if they sought to mischief him, to stand to their harms. So saying, he boldly leapt ashore, and they gathered around him with intent to slay him, but there then arose a great cry among the women, and it was because they had now observed that his sail was a baby's nightgown, whereupon they straightway loved him, and grieved that their laps were too small the which I cannot explain, except by saying that such is the way of women. The men fairies now sheathed their weapons on observing the behaviour of their women, on whose intelligence they set great store, 
and they led him civilly to their queen, who conferred upon him the courtesy of the gardens after lockout time, and henceforth Peter could go whither he chose, and the fairies had orders to put him in comfort. Such was his first voyage to the gardens, and you may gather from the antiquity of the language that it took place a long time ago. But Peter never grows any older, and if we could be watching for him under the bridge tonight, but of course we can't, I dare say we should see him hoisting his nightgown and sailing or paddling toward us in the thrush's nest. When he sails, he sits down, but he stands up to paddle. I shall tell you presently how he got his paddle. Long before the time for the opening of the gates comes, he steals back to the island, for people must not see him. He is not so human as all that. But this gives him hours for play, and he plays exactly as real children play. At least he thinks so, and it is one of the pathetic things about him that he often plays quite wrongly. You see, he had no one to tell him how children really play, for the fairies were all more or less in hiding until dusk, and so know nothing, and though the birds pretended that they could tell him a great deal, when the time for telling came, it was wonderful how little they really knew. They told him the truth about hide-and-seek, and he often plays it by himself, but even the ducks on the round pond could not explain to him what it is that makes the pond so fascinating to boys. Every night the ducks have forgotten all the events of the day, except the number of pieces of cake thrown to them. They are gloomy creatures and say that cake is not what it was in their young days. So Peter had to find out many things for himself. He often played ships at the round pond, but his ship was only a hoop which he had found on the grass. Of course, he'd never seen a hoop, and he wondered what you play at with them, and decided that you play at pretending they are boats. This hoop always sank at once, but he waded in for it, and sometimes he dragged it gleefully round the rim of the pond, and he was quite proud to think that he had discovered what boys do with hoops. Another time, when he found a child's pail, he thought it was for sitting in, and he sat so hard in it that he could scarcely get out of it. Also, he found a balloon. It was bobbing about on the hump, quite as if it was having a game by itself, and he caught it after an exciting chase. But he thought it was a ball, and Jenny Wren had told him that boys kick balls, so he kicked it, and after that he could not find it anywhere. Perhaps the most surprising thing he found was a perambulator. It was under a lime tree, near the entrance to the Fairy Queen's winter palace, which is within the circle of the seven Spanish chestnuts, and Peter approached it warily, for the birds had never mentioned such things to him. Lest it was alive, he addressed it politely, and then, as it gave no answer, he went nearer and felt it cautiously. He gave it a little push and it ran from him, which made him think it must be alive after all. But as it had run from him, he was not afraid. So he stretched out his hand to pull it to him, but this time it ran at him, and he was so alarmed that he leapt the railing and scudded away to his boat. You must not think, however, that he was a coward, for he came back next night with a crust in one hand and a stick in the other, but the perambulator had gone, and he never saw another one. I have promised to tell you also about his paddle. It was a child's spade, which he had found near St. Gover's well, and he thought it was a paddle. 
Do you pity Peter Pan for making these mistakes? If so, I think it rather silly of you. What I mean is that, of course, one must pity him now and then, but to pity him all the time would be impertinence. He thought he had the most splendid time in the gardens, and to think you have it is almost quite as good as really to have it. He played without ceasing, while you often waste time by being Mad Dog or Mary Annish. He could be neither of these things, for he had never heard of them. But do you think he is to be pitied for that? Oh, he was merry. He was as much merrier than you, for instance, as you are merrier than your father. Sometimes he fell, like a spinning top, from sheer merriment. Have you seen a greyhound leaping the fences of the gardens? That is how Peter leaps them. And think of the music of his pipe. Gentlemen who walk home at night write to the papers to say they heard a nightingale in the gardens. But it is really Peter's pipe they hear. Of course, he had no mother. At least, what use was she to him? You can be sorry for him for that. But don't be too sorry, for the next thing I mean to tell you is how he revisited her. It was the fairies who gave him the chance. End of chapter 15